Hi, everyone. I think we're going to get started here in just a minute, so if everybody could come take a seat. Um, we're going to get started on our second session. Welcome ha back to the Furniture in the Future Symposium that we have are hosting jointly between the Renwick and uh, the Sam and Alfredo Maloof Foundation. For this afternoon's program, we've invited six artists to give short presentations about their own work. We wanted to run this in an almost Pecha Kucha style, so we've given them just a few minutes to tell us briefly about something that they are interested in, something that they're doing right now um, in a rapid fire format that keeps things lively. Uh, and then they will be taking part in a panel moderated by Glenn Adamson, who has graciously agreed to uh, run this afternoon's program, and he'll provide a summation at the the end. Uh, so to introduce the artists in this half of the program, I'd like to first introduce Glenn. As many of you know, Glenn Adamson is a curator and theorist who works across the fields of design, craft, and contemporary art. He was until March 2016 the director of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. He was previously the head of research at the Victoria and Albert Museum and curator at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. He's published prolifically some of the most insightful works in our field in books including Art in the Making, 2016, Invention of Craft, 2013, Postmodernism, Style and Subversion in 2011, The Craft Reader in 2010, and Thinking Through Craft from 2007. So please welcome Glenn Adamson. Uh, thank you, Nora. And uh, before I introduce the artists, I just want to say that one of the signal pleasures of this uh, trip down to DC has been to see Nora's curatorial work at the Renwick. It's absolutely extraordinary to see that building entirely filled with her creativity and expertise. Uh, obviously, the Invitational that opened last night with four great artists, but also the uh, immaculate installation of the collection, which has never looked better in the upstairs gallery. So Nora, congratulations. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing an absolutely stellar panel of makers that have been put together uh, for the event. Uh, really the leading voices and figures in furniture at the moment. And I know that we're here to discuss furniture in the future. And so you're going to have the future of furniture arrayed before you on stage. And it's very fitting that in that group, we start with Wendell Castle, who has represented the leading edge of the discipline uh, for many years and is still uh, riding the wave of new technology, new ideas, and creativity. Um, he definitely falls under the category of people who don't need an introduction, and I'm sure you know his work. Uh, but being based in Rochester, uh, again, for many years now, uh, he has been uh, working lately with robotics uh, and other advanced technology applications that have allowed him to expand his already extremely impressive range of furniture vocabulary into an entirely new space. So we're going to be hearing from Wendell first. Uh, in the interest of speed, I'm going to tell you who else we're going to be hearing from all at once now. Uh, and I'll do it just briefly. Uh, Wendy Mariama is next, another of our great long-standing leaders of the field, um, known for her uh, very politically intense and critical uh, projects, not just furniture, but also art and installations, and also her teaching out at San Diego, where she's, uh, she's uh, inspired generations of students following uh, in her wake. After Wendy, we'll hear from Bill Hilgendorf and Jason Horvath, two graduates of the Rhode Island School of Design who, like me, live in Brooklyn, New York, and are, uh, I think, exemplary of the new maker movement entrepreneurial energy that's happening, not just in Brooklyn, but especially in that part of the world. Uh, then, then we'll hear from Christy Oates, uh, who is again, a very technologically inventive and innovative maker. And I just was talking to Christy. She's just moved to Wisconsin, her home state, and having lived there for five years myself, I know what a pleasure that is to live in Wisconsin. So she'll be next. Uh, then we'll um, hear from Larry White, who is the uh, artist in residence at the Maloof Foundation, so bringing it back home to Sam and his legacy. And last but certainly not least, Vivian Beer, uh, possibly known to you from Ellen DeGeneres's TV show uh, about, um, about uh, competitive making, but a furniture designer that I've gotten to know well because she was in an exhibition called Pathmakers about women in art, craft, and design, which we originated at MAD and then came here to Washington, D.C. at the National Museum for Women in the Arts, and she is a uh, master's degree holder from Cranbrook Academy. So without any further ado, I'm going to invite Wendell Castle up to the stage to be followed by Wendy and then the rest of our great panel. Wendell.
just mines that are just going to run. They're just, okay, if it's set up to run, then yeah, it'll like just Yeah, like 10 seconds each. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. not going to talk about that. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll give you a quiet minute. Good afternoon. In, uh, in the interest of uh, sticking to my 10 minutes, I have written it out and timed it. <laughs> so I should be within a few seconds. There are three things close to my heart that I would like to quickly mention today. Art, creativity, critical thinking, and technology. These are the things that I think about each day. First of all, let me define my definition of creativity. I believe creativity can be simply defined as doing something for the first time that is valued by others. A true artist or designer is someone who does something for the first time. Something that is valued by others something human, something which touches others. It's not art if the world, or at least some small portion of it, is not transformed in some way. Most of all, it's not art if there is no risk. It's not the risk of financial ruin, although it could be. It's the risk of rejection and failure. Art requires the artist to care and to care enough to do something even when we suspect that it might not work. I had to lay one brick on another, set thousands of ideas on paper before getting an authentic one dragged up from my guts. I haven't the slightest idea what my future work will look like. My drawings and models are the slenderest of help. I may scrap them all. I invent, distort, deform, inflate, exaggerate, compound, and confuse as I see fit. I obey my own instincts, which I often do not understand myself. I often draw things I do not understand, but secure in the knowledge that at some point they may become clear and meaningful. I have faith in myself. I have had to learn to think, feel, and see in my own way, which can be the hardest thing in the world. Whatever progress there is in art comes not from adaptation, but through daring. Decision-making is our biggest challenge. There is a large problem with making safe and sensible decisions. It's that so does everyone else. I find no reason to be sensible, practical, or reasonable. In fact, my work of the last 10 years might be considered to be anti-design. I often, or always, do not adhere to any design norms. I liken practical things. I don't think things have to be sensible. I live an impractical life. I dress impractically. I drive in practical cars. I make impractical furniture. I have no interest in being practical. I believe this kind of lifestyle is conductive to creativity. For me, the reason creativity is so exciting is that when I am, am involved in it, I am living more fully than doing other parts of my life. The excitement of the work in the studio comes so close to the ideal fulfillment we all hope to get from life. Creativity also leaves an outcome that adds to the richness and complexity of our universal experience. I constantly try to forget what I already know. I had to learn things in new ways, in an, unge in an uneducated way, my own way which is not easy. I had to throw myself into the current, knowing that I may well sink. The great majority of artists are throwing themselves in with life preservers around their necks, and more often than not, it's a life preserver that sinks them. Whatever progress there is to be comes through 
comes not through adaptation, but through daring. Nothing in life is foolproof. The Titanic was supposed to be an unsinkable ship. Every 100% sure thing has an iceberg out there with your name on it. I believe the difference between being successful and unsuccessful, the creatively, I should say, is the ability to alternate between our emotional and our rational thinking, which forces us to always consider how we are actually thinking. I don't believe anyone should buy an artwork for investment. Buy it because you love it, and you will be its caretaker for a while. Don't pay any attention to the market. I don't make what someone wants. I make what I feel like is right. It's the only way to move forward. I have no one asking me to make the things I make. That's my responsibility as an artist, and it means I must always take that risk. My studio joined the digital age about nine years ago. At first, just with scanning. I still do all my, my uh, idea sketching on paper. Designing on a computer is not for me. A computer has a mind of its own. It wants to fix what it perceives as mistakes. It wants to, for example, smooth out a blip in a curve. Computer design looks like computer design. I want the blips and other inconsistencies to remain. My solution is to make scale models which are scanned and then entered into the computer. This has been a great help, but an even greater help is that we needed to get a CNC machine of some sort. After a great deal of research, uh, we end up purchasing an ABB 6400 large robot, which has been fantastic in more ways than I can mention now, but maybe later. Working memory is an essential tool of the imagination. Something we all need to do is pay attention. We need to think until the necessary thoughts intersect. The process is slow, but the answer or insight will gradually reveal itself. I have now had more yesterdays than I will have tomorrows. I look forward each day to the excitement of not knowing what my future will look like, how it will be made, what it will be made out of, Art itself is like a voyage of discovery. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and unfortunately, I didn't prepare good notes like one did. I'm basically going to be flying from the cinnamon pit, <laughs> but I'm hoping that. Um, sorry, this is a. This is a. This is a PC, so I'm not familiar with how to advance the slides here. Can somebody help? Uh, so you can do this, this arrow. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to start with a piece of furniture and pretty much I speak to my back ground as a craft person. Uh, being a craft person and being a furniture maker is almost part of my ethnicity in a way. It's part of my total package. And so what I've tried to do is um, integrate um, video in this particular piece to speak to um, I'm not sure how to make the video work. <coughs> Sorry, this is not good, I apologize. 
Um, I'll just, I'll just keep talking here. Um, I created a video to express uh, the issues of gender and ethnicity and perceptions of Asian women. And this is a vanity that was designed for a show called Inspired by China. And in the video, which is not working, unfortunately, is that uh, my sister Karen, who is an actress and improv theater teacher, and she, um, in the video, puts on makeup to accentuate her Asian features. Uh, we've met, um, I don't know about other Asian women, women but I have heard the term Dragon Lady, um, the inscrutable Asian looks, and so those are the kind of things that I wanted to embody in this particular piece of furniture. Um, my work is marked by uh, residency opportunities, and I was given a chance to work in New New York City for six months, and I wanted to research my family history. Um, my family lived in California during World War II, and of course after what, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, Japanese Americans were forced to move away from this exclusion zone that you see on the map. If you lived to the rest of that exclusion zone, you had to get the hell out of there by a certain time, or you were in prison that the various, um, what they called camps, but basically I call them prison, they were incarcerated in the ten different prisons that you see that are marked with a triangle. Uh, my own family chose to self-evacuate, um, in many ways, I think maybe that might have been a mistake because they were torn away from their family. They were torn away from, from other Japanese Americans and they were pretty much forced to strike it out on their own. My grandfather, like this particular person, had to give up his business. Uh, he basically gave it to um, some of his business partners. And this is a photograph of one of the prisons in Manzanar. All the camps were pretty much identical in that they were in the most remote locations of the United States. Um, this is located in California. So I decided that I knew so little about my family history because in history classes we didn't talk about this. And my parents did not talk about it either. So I took it upon myself to use the research towards a new body of work which uh, em em embraces the furniture form. And I felt like it was very much like a diorama of sorts. I think furniture is really magical in many ways because you're able to um, create the exterior of being one personality and then the interior can be completely unexpected. These pieces were made out of very humble woods. They were made of pine and fur, which basically was the materials that were used to build the camp. I mean, there's no such thing as fancy wood at the camp. Um, this is the piece called A Question of Loyalty. Every Japanese American had to answer a series of 35 questions, and these were the most controversial because you were asked to um, pledge allegiance to the United States of America. You were asked to serve in the armed forces, and you were also asked to um, obliterate any allegiance to the emperor of Japan, which was very puzzling to most 
Japanese Americans who were born in the States. I mean, they had never been to Japan. But yet, some of them thought, okay, I'm going to answer yes. They had to go to camp. But if you answered no, you still had to go to camp. So it was kind of a lose-lose proposition here. I mean, you know, mind you, this is stuff that I just learned. I mean, here I, you know, here I am at the age of 64, and only about five years ago did I really learn the details of the Japanese, in, you know, incarceration camp. This is based on yeah, the structures that um, house the prisoners, and it also incorporated bits of ephemera that I picked up around the camps, like pieces of tumbleweed and cactus bits, and I really wanted to get, get a sense of the kind of environment that they are for first forced to live in. This is another cabinet, very simple and straightforward, but it contains a broken piece of Japanese pottery that represented the last of the sense of history and, and uh, ethnicity, maybe. They had to abandon the kind of food they were comfortable with. And also the doors do not run parallel, so they constantly hit each other because, because of the family discord within the family. So I felt like the function of furniture also gave me this tour, this visual tour, to use to express that difficulty. Um, these are some photographs by Dorothea Long. She was hired by the WRA to document the, the uh, removal of Japanese Americans, and I noticed that they all wore these tags, they were ID tags, each, all 120,000 Japanese Americans had to wear these tags that had their name, ID number, and the location of the prison. So I set it upon myself to try to recreate every single tag by reproducing the tag itself based on what was remaining in the Japanese American National History Museum. And I looked up all the names and the numbers on the website I also aged the tags to make them look more authentic. And I enlisted, of course I couldn't have done them all by myself. So I went to history teachers that were teaching high school, and I asked to be integrated into their program so that when they were talking about World War II, I would bring the tags to their classes. And so the students got to experience, perhaps to get a sense of, you know, these are real people. And they got to see Japanese names for the first time, maybe. This was in Tennessee. It was really important for me to bring the tag to the South. Because if I didn't learn about this in high school in 1965, I had a lot of doubt that maybe some of the more remote areas of the U.S ever covered that even now in 2014 or 15, which is when this was taken. So um, with that, I was able to create a interpretive experience. Um, as a child, I really loved going to natural history museums where they incorporate um, ephemera or um, videos of, of the subject at hand. In this case, I borrowed um, artifacts from the Japanese American Historical Society that had all the um, suitcases that were used. They could only take one suitcase. Each person could only carry one suitcase to the prison. Uh, and some of these people donated those suitcases 
to the museum. A lot of people from San Diego were fishermen, so they had to abandon all their fishing poles, which I showed earlier here. Um, and then the tags were suspended in, by individual camp, and I had an interesting question in Madison, Wisconsin. They asked me, how did I decide to um, show the tags in this manner? And I felt like this was the most effective because hanging from eighth inch uh, cable, they had a tendency to move on their own, and if you walk by, you can hear the tags rustle. So it was almost like a spiritual experience. Maybe the ghosts were speaking to us in a way. So that, to me, worked very well. Um, and then, of course, my artwork was displayed with the tags. And I also wanted to mention that craft was a very big part of keeping the incarcerated from going insane. So they made a lot of objects out of metal and wood. They did painting. They, they, the one thing that kept them sane, I believe. And so these are some of the artifacts that they made in the camp. Now, I've always been a sucker for wildlife, and I was in uh, Tasmania and spent some time doing some research on the history of the Tasmanian tiger. And I made this uh, another shrine to um, the Tasmanian tiger. This is the last living Tasmanian tiger that was in the Hobart Zoo. Um, they were hunted to extinction by the farmers who thought that they w were threatening to the chickens and the livestock, which tended not to be the case at all. But uh, anyway, uh, man did a good job of decimating the species. Um, I love animals again, and uh, as most of you know, the elephant is being very threatened by poaching, and I wanted to make a body of work about the wildlife pro problem with the intent that proceeds of sales of this work will also be donated to the various advocacy groups in Africa. So these are some of the details. Now, I show this because um, it, was, it took me a while to figure out how do I make something really large that's not cumbersome technically and physically and uh, the, the best way that I could think of was to cut the wood into very thin pieces and stitch them together. And the very process of stitching became kind of cathartic because I felt like I was trying to mend a problem, you know. And so that was part of the process, a very important part of the process. I was invited to go to Piotrzec as an artist in residence and work with a group of really wonderful uh, glass blowers, Nancy Callan and Dan Friday, and created a sarcophagus of blown glass tusk for the exhibition that opened at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And this shows the installation of that work. Uh, so you can see all five of the, the main masks that I made. Um, I was invited to go to Nepal this spring, and I decided to use th that opportunity to be a, uh, an opportunity to campaign for the elephants that were being ridden for the, you know, for the tourist industry, uh, eco-touring, which I think is a really bad thing. But I was also able to collaborate with a Nepali carver who carved part of the element, elements of this piece. 
And while I was in Nepal, I created, uh, okay, I created a poster that uh, talked about the the bad things about um, trekking. And I think my time is up, so I'm going to go through these really quickly. This is the shrine to an elephant. The bell rings every 15 minutes, which is when an elephant is killed. And this is called Cenotaph, which is to the rhinoceros, which is also being pushed to extinction using glass and steel. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Bill Hilgendorf from Uhuru Design. Uh, Jason, my, the other founder, couldn't be here because he got uh, stuck in Hong Kong. Uh, his flight got canceled. But um, he was actually there checking in with some factories that we do work with, uh, production furniture work uh, over there, and he's on his way back. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, Uhuru is a multidisciplinary design firm based up in Brooklyn. Uh, Jason and I started the company back in 2004 when we were pretty fresh out of uh, the industrial design program at RISD. And um, our work ranges uh, from sort of bespoke, highly crafted individual pieces to um, desking systems. We launched a desking system this summer, as well as uh, hotel and restaurant furniture produced in the thousands. Um, we're actually about to produce our 10,000th chair for Shake Shack. Um, this month, so um, it's quite a balance, and it's been really interesting to hear some of the different presentations this morning. As we sort of, it's it's uh, something that I'm constantly thinking about. Sort of this, where we fall in between something that's really high end and the best quality that we can make and the best craft that we can produce, and something that can be produced on a scale that's available to more people. Um, so I think we're something that, at least uh, at Uhuru, Jason and I are always sort of struggling with that idea. Um, in this presentation, I'm just going to go through a little bit about um, a process that we call narrative design, and it's sort of the storytelling that we do um, through our collections. And this is, this is more of, of what we call our signature work, which is the core kind of of the company, of the brand, of our design, um, and the, the pieces at which all the other sort of collections that come off of that kind of iterate from. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the process um, of our sort of narrative design as it's evolved over the last 10 years, 12 years of our work. Um, so uh, one of our first collections uh, we launched back in 2006 um, was, uh, was called the BK Collection. We were, we were fresh in Brooklyn then. And um, when we started, we used a lot of reclaimed and found materials, uh, basically uh, offcuts from custom projects we're working on and, and things that we found on the street. Uh, New York is constantly in process of rebuilding itself, so there's a lot of good material uh, that comes up. And uh, on top is, is our stoolin, and that was the first piece that I designed for our first collection. And um, it was entirely originally made out of scraps that we produced, and then sort of as we did more, we sort of built a network of wood shops in Brooklyn that we would collect scraps from. Uh, to build the pieces. And then the, the piece on the bottom is our beam table, and that's uh, just two uh, yellow heart pine beams uh, that were, um, Jason and I, the original one, we, uh, I was going to an, an art opening in Chelsea, and I saw these beams in a dumpster, and we came back the next day with a pickup truck and grabbed them. And so that was sort of how that piece came to be. Um, as, our, as we progressed, um, we sort of started to seek out materials. And, and objects that had reached the end of their lifespan and their sort of current iteration. Um, oops. And um, the idea was to, to take a material or a, an object that had you know, sort of specific limitations. In this 
uh, case for the coupe line, we used uh, Kentucky bourbon barrels. Jason, my business partner, is from Kentucky. And uh, he had some good connections with some distilleries. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys know, but bourbon barrels can only be used once to make bourbon. After that, um, a lot of them get broken down and shipped to Scotland to finish uh, scotch in. Um, but you know, many of them don't make the cut and, sorry? Many of them don't make the cut and um, become planters or firewood. So we got our hands on a couple. And what was interesting for us in this uh, was sort of, you know, you had to work with this you know, compound curved stave. It's charred on the inside. On the outside, it's got the staining from the interaction with the iron bands that surround it that oxidize into the wood. Um, so it really had like some sort of specific limitations. And um, for this piece, which is our bilge lounge chair, we also used um, leaf springs from New York City fire trucks um, uh, to, to form the base. So the, the chair actually has a really nice uh, give to it uh, when you sit down. It uses that spring steel um, in a functional way as well. Um, I guess on another side note, uh, th I've, I realized that there's a lot of chairs in my presentation. As a designer, um, we're, I don't know, I'm compelled to design chairs. It's, I think it's like the pinnacle of, of furniture design for some, for some reason. Although, as we've done more workplace design and really started thinking about not only ergonomics, but just how the way that people work and stuff. We uh, we tend to, to to think of sitting. I mean, er, there's more information that's coming out that sitting is really bad for us. You know, as as we've heard, and um, sometimes we joke that sitting is the next smoking. And um, <laughs> but as someone who loves to design chairs, I find that hard to take to heart. Um, so then, after that, um, we sort of started to get known as these guys who like to use interesting materials. And so someone, uh, the, they were tearing up sections of the iconic Coney Island boardwalk in New York. And uh, someone came to us and said, hey, I got some of this boardwalk. Do you guys want to check it out? I know you guys like to do stuff with this kind of material. Um, and we said, sure. But we really had no idea what we were going to do with it. Um, so we went down to Coney Island. And we did this whole photo essay. It was middle of winter. It was desolate, snow on the ground. And we sort of thought that it was going to be this, this Coney Island in the off season. It was this gray boardwalk, um, just really kind of bleak. But as we milled it down, we realized that the, this is one of the first sort of importations of Ipe uh, from South America into the country. And Ipe is actually a, a large number of species. And so all these colors sort of started to come out in the wood. And it really sort of exposed itself. The, the vibrancy of Coney Island. Um, and what we did with this collection, um, which was sort of a first thing for us, was we really looked at the, not only the material, but also like the surroundings of it to really understand the history of where the material came from, the context. Um, and a lot of the designs for the collection were based on the landmark structures of Coney Island, the Cyclone roller coaster, uh, the Wonder Wheel, Ferris wheel, and then the parachute jump. Um, and this is one, a detail of one other piece from the collection. It's a, it's a, it's a console table. And um, this is actually made from the offcuts from the last piece, from the cyclone. Um, as we milled those pieces for the, the seat, we cut off these edges. Um, and the edges are the, you know, the, what we call the original face, sort of that really weathered wood. And you get like the most sort of definition of the, the wear and the use and the elements um, breaking into it. Um, also not a PC user. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then this is just sort of lightly sanded and with a little bit of oil and you get to see that. that um. So this is, a, this is a collection that actually we're currently working on and we're going to launch um, this fall. Um, and this is where, um, as our design work evolved, we started to think a little bit more about the concept of the narrative concept, not just as a story about material, but really about the impact of time on materials and objects, and sort of capturing the surface of an object, that patina that gets built as it ages, as it's affected by nature, um, both the elements um, in its built environment as well as like the natural elements, the weathering. Um, so this is a fold collection, and it's inspired um, in two parts. One is uh, I started collecting these, these pieces of metal that I would find in the street 
on my way to work, uh, walking in, in our neighborhood in Red Hook, and just sort of objects that were crushed in the, in the street. And I really started to, to get interested in these, these metal pallet straps. So they're used to, to attach goods um, or material to a pallet, and they often get cut off in the street and then you know, flatten, run over, and they sort of sit there for forever and weather and stuff. And so I started playing with the different, um, the different shapes and the different sort of ways that they could bend and fold and the interesting um, <coughs> d different um, things you could get out of it. And then uh, the other aspect is um, when we talk of uh, the last slide about the sort of original face versus like a cut face on a reclaimed material. You know, you can often have this very weathered side, but then when you mill into it, then you have a, a very clean side that's almost like a new piece of material. So that sort of mix, that uh, offset of an original face with kind of like a less weathered face. Um, and what came out of that is um, these pieces, which are quarter inch solid brass plate, um, and there's two, there's two finishes. One is, is a very dark antique uh, patina, and then one is sort of a medium light and, uh, patina. And then the edge is like a polished brass. And um, there's just one other side of the whole collection. So this is the whole collection that, that we're doing. And um, you can see there's a couple consoles and uh, coffee table and, and stuff. So yeah, thanks. I'm Christy Oates. Um, I have sort of a traditional background in furniture. I grew up in an upholstery shop in Wisconsin when I was younger, and I'd always been around furniture growing up. And uh, when I was going to school at San Diego State during my MFA with Wendy, um, I got into um, digital furniture making. So I'm going to show just a few projects um, from basically my, my digital point forward. And I actually started out making a lot of these pieces by hand. So this is a table that folds down from the wall. And um, this was then part of my thesis show. Um, this was a table that folded out from the wall. This piece was actually made by hand. And I'm just going to quickly go through these pieces because I have a video um, that plays the exhibition and the folding processes of these pieces. Um, this chair is in the Renwick collection. It was in the 40 Under 40 show. And hopefully I can get this to play. So this was my MFA exhibition. And I apologize, the video quality is not fabulous. Oh, and I have no sound.
So that. <laughs> Thank you. That lamp and the chair in that show were actually in the 40 Under 40 show at the Renwick. And then I kept making, um, and then I integrated uh, marquetry into the pieces as well. So this uh, piece has a um, marquetry element, and I'll play the process video for this piece. So after that piece, I was actually working in a manufacturing facility, so I had access to all their equipment, and I got to play quite a bit with their machines. So I started thinking more about marquetry, and especially in a traditional sense. And so I wanted to kind of mimic a traditional um, marquetry sort of design, but in a different way, because I didn't want it to look like I was just trying to copy a piece of traditional marquetry. Um, so this piece, the format of it kind of looks like a traditional piece, but then when you get up to it and you realize it's a circuit board. So I'll play the process video for this one.
So um, while making that piece, it was, you know, I came up with the concept and I took the pictures and I did all the computer work and then I put it together and it sort of felt like there wasn't much craftsmanship involved because there wasn't much handwork involved. So I wanted to explore kind of a um, automation process. Like I felt like an assembly line while I was putting that together. So I wanted to push that a little bit further and say, well, what if I automatically made the art as well? Um, so this project, Kaleidoscope Algorithm, was actually an exploration of that. I wanted to come up with the concepts, the photographs um, for each piece and then digitally manipulate them. But I wanted to do it in a way where I wasn't making any decisions at all. So basically what I did was there's 30 pieces and they're for every day of the month it's September 2011 and I just kind of randomly picked a month and said this is what I'm going with and so I took the top Google search trend for that day and then I took an image that was associated with that trend I digitally manipulated every image in the same way and I kind of came up with the pattern just from that and put them together um, so there's 30 pieces and as you can see because there was no planning involved. Some of them look kind of boring, some are more interesting, some are really boring. <laughs> but um, it was an interesting process and especially an interesting series for me. And I've got a video that goes through one um, of these pieces and it was for September 30th. And the, let me see, is this playing? The Google search trend of the day was Anwar al-Awlaki, because that's the day we sent over a drone to kill Anwar al-Awlaki. And so, um, as you'll see coming up, the search term. And then I went and found the top news story for the day that was associated with that search term. And I'm going to try to skip ahead a little bit. I see I'm running out of time. If I can. And so I took that uh, photograph, and then I ma basically did a live trace of it in Illustrator, and separated all the colors into different wood species. And then each image was um, digitally manipulated. And then you can see the final piece. I want to play the end. Okay, and then I've just got a couple more pieces to show. Um, this again was uh, a marquetry project, and I was really inspired by um, Tom Schrunk's work. He taught me how to do marquetry by hand when I was in uh, undergraduate school at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. So he had a huge inspiration on my work. <coughs> And um, the nice thing about his work is it's lustrous marquetry. So as you move around the piece, the light changes with it. And then this piece was also um, based on this work and one of, another one of the folding chairs. And then um, this is the last one I'll show. This is a project I've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, I basically make uh, pre-cut marquetry pieces and then I sell them to people so they can do them themselves. So I kind of wanted to get this uh, conversation going about, you know, mass production and, um, you know, DIY marquetry kind of thing. The response to these have been quite interesting. A lot of times I get um, woodworkers that will take this and they'll inlay it into a project or something like that. Um, and then I have more pieces too where they can do you know, they can keep adding on to it and do like an entire wall or table or whatever. So it's kind of interesting to see, to go from um, hand making work to digitally hand making work to just selling people pre-cut pieces and having them make my work for me. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. That was great. <laughs> uh, I think these are the only digitals I have going for me right now. <laughs> uh, I'm really just uh, bewildered by these whole processes, and uh, I find it fascinating, and, and uh, it's just really interesting uh, way to look into the future. My name's Larry White. I was, uh, had the opportunity to be Sam Malouf's first paid employee. <coughs> And I joined him back in 1962 as a 19-year-old art student, studying all the arts. I'm um, a mixed media artist and uh, sculptor to this day. Uh, I managed to work with Sam 29 years, and during that time maintained my own studio and keep my own work going as well. Uh, today, uh, uh, I want to talk about Sam and kind of the mischief that goes on in Sam Maloof woodworking. Uh, and give you kind of an idea of what it's like to be in that environment. Uh, if you look at the top uh, right uh, image here, you'll see a chair that Sam made in 1949-50. He was 33 years old. And if we look down at the bottom left corner, um, that was one of the last uh, several pieces that Sam designed at the age of 93. And uh, so I call it 60 years of perfection. Um, however, Sam would never condone the use of that word, I don't think. Um, uh, I, uh, I think he would uh, be displeased. Let's see. Um, these are a few pieces that Sam designed over the year that were kind of iconic uh, pieces. Uh, laced uh, leather uh, black walnut bench. Uh, this is the single model, single seater. Uh, this is an idea of the kind of dining sets that we would uh, make for a client. Uh, you can see the two in front are a host and hostess chair. Uh, this is Mike Johnson, my co-worker. Uh, Mike's been with uh, the Maloof uh, with Sam for 35, going on 36 years now, uh, and worked side by side with Sam during the last few years of his life. Uh, this is a, a stand-up desk that's in progress. Uh, I wanted to show this slide because it's one of the rare uh, instances where Sam actually carved on a piece of furniture. Most of his uh, work, if you are familiar with it, is very rectilinear and very simple, straightforward, beautiful design. This is uh, Sam um, receiving a large walnut tree from Northern California. Uh, after Sam turned 90 years old, uh, he purchased two more of these trees. His theory was that if he kept buying wood, he would live to be a very, very old man <laughs> in order to process it. Uh, and here, um, we're stickering it to uh, dry it. For those of you who don't know, uh, that three-inch material takes about a uh, year per inch to dry before you can use it. And so we're looking at maybe four or five years down the road to process this material. Uh, this shows one of the large dining tables that we uh, have made there and the kind of uh, enormous uh, truss system that's underneath to support that weight. It's about 11 feet long, 11 and a half feet long, about five feet wide. This is a cradle uh, being made in progress. This is one that I made. Um, this is probably Sam's more sculptural, one of the more sculptural pieces that he designed. Uh, and here I'm in the process of uh, building the basket for it. Uh, I've got the trestle put together now, and so it's uh, reached that point where it's going to be shaped and then finished sanded. You're looking at a piece that takes about uh, six, six and a half weeks to build. This is the final piece. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have this one back to the Maloof collection. Uh, in 1997, I built two of these for a client, and he was generous enough to donate it back to our uh, archives, so we have one in the collection. Uh, in Sam's later years, he started working with live edge uh, wood, imported wood, which he hadn't done for most of his career. This is a piece of red jar from Australia. 
Uh, it's about five and a half uh, feet in diameter with a, a large support base under it. Uh, this is a, uh, a uh, rose myrtle from Tasmania, uh, a live edge piece that we made for a client. This is the classic side chair and its companion table out of curly maple. This is Sam working on that chaise that we saw in the first image. Uh, at this point in time, Sam is 93 years old and having a little more difficulty handling material. And so Mike Johnson uh, worked side by side with Sam. This piece was designed on the fly in real time. Sam making the adjustments, aesthetic adjustments, um, on an hourly basis. Uh, and uh, here he is test driving it. Uh, he, we had to set it up for him so he could check the, the rocking pattern and the balance of it. Uh, and this is the second piece in that series, in those last uh, few pieces that he made. Uh, he's drawing in the shaping lines so that Mike can follow those to when he starts shaping the piece after it's finished the completion. This is it, completed in the classic black leather. Uh, it's just a gorgeous uh, lyrical piece, uh, really beautiful. Uh, this is the second one you saw him drawing on, uh, and this is upholstered in his favorite fabric, Jack Luna Larson fabric, a longtime friend, and Sam used that uh, fabric almost exclusively throughout his career. And uh, this is Sam sitting at the preview of the show that those pieces were made for. Um, it was a retrospective opening at the Riverside Art Museum in Southern California. Sam was not feeling that well, and within two months, um, we lost him. Uh, so the legacy does continue. The, Sam formed a corporation which uh, allowed the uh, individuals that worked with him all those years to uh, continue making his designs. Um, this is the classic iconic rocker. Uh, this chair here was made by either Mike or myself. We can't really tell which. Uh, in this slide, we both had acquired those skills. This shows you some of the detail work that goes into one of these magnificent pieces. Just so you get a sense of the shaping and the kind of forming that goes on, the kind of time. There's about three and a half weeks in one of these. A wood called Zercody from Belize. Uh, the classic low back. This is uh, some of the shaping that goes into these. Uh, the settee out of black walnut, uh, which is an extension of the low back. Another view. Uh, a a uh, walnut music stand that uh, I made. This was a piece that was made um, when we would get a request, a request for a piece that was the, um, uh, that Sam hadn't made, we would have to design it in the, the Maloof aesthetic. And this is an example of a hall tree that, that we got a commission from. We introduced these pieces. Uh, these were designs from 1956 um, that we reintroduced into the collection. This is a rocking chair that I designed off that last fan back chair. Uh, I thought it was such a beautiful piece, the, the original. This is one that Mike Johnson made from 1958. You can see it's a very complicated piece. This is, it extended out uh, three seats deep to make a sofa in the Larson fabric, which was uh, vintage. This is 1954 that we reintroduced, a much simpler version of the one we saw. This is our showroom at the compound. This is looking through our shop windows out at our environment, uh, showing you uh, 60 years of patterns and, and templates that Sam developed. This is our shaping room. Uh, looking at a maple rocker. This is Sam's a, a beautiful home that he built over 45 years. Uh, the foundation owns it and there's tours twice a week there now. This is the new house Sam designed uh, that they built for him when they moved his compound. Uh, an example of casework we built for the new house. Uh, another example. These are some uh, lowbacks that we call uh, lowbacks on steroids. Uh, they're about 10% larger, 23 of them we built for a yacht being built down in uh, Florida uh, out of a wood called Sepele. 
really beautiful wood, like an Af African mahogany family. And uh, these are the whole series complete. Uh, the corporation is still functioning. Mike and his son Stephen are still producing and receiving orders. And uh, uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on there. So I hope you come to visit us sometime. <laughs> Thank you. And now for something completely different, right? <laughs> um, I was asked to uh, speak about probably one of the, maybe the least academic projects I've ever done in my career. Um, this past year, I participated in a design challenge that Ellen DeGeneres put together for HDTV. And, uh, you know, at first you're thinking just, whoa, reality TV, can I do that? I'm not sure. And um, I always like to say my, my family has a motto, and that is, well, how hard could it be, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, I truly believe the most important thing in being a maker um, and experiencing life fully is to say yes to things. So I said yes, and then was introduced to a very unreasonable timeline. Uh, we were just talking about how long a chair could take to make. Um, we did a, a series of design challenges where we would have three days to design and make something, and that ended up about an active uh, 24, 20 to 24 hours of work time um, with just yourself and one, one partner um, that was uh, randomly selected for you um, out of the HGTV, and I had Matt Bladshaw. Um, you can see that gentleman. We, we didn't call each other to... to coordinate what we wore each day, but it seemed like that's how it happened. Um, but so it ended up, uh, you know, you're, you're thinking, wow, this is completely unreasonable. And one of the great things about it is it, it, was, it was such a, uh, I think, an open and supportive atmosphere, um, other than the timeline. Um, and you could see a lot of different friendships um, growing in between the carpenter and the designer. I mean, everybody had a different skill set and a different point of view, diff different attitude. Um, we're very well paired in personality. Um, <laughs> so, so it's storytelling in a lot of ways. Um, this is the kind of work that I usually make, um, which wasn't going to happen in 20 some hours. Um, I've made a career of uh, highly crafted objects out of industrial materials and um, really raising those up through attention to detail. Um, sometimes, the, you know, a lot of pieces, they take hundreds of hours um, to make and sometimes years to plan out. Um, so how hard could it be, right, to do it in three days? <laughs> so how, how did we pull that off? Um, a lot of it did end up being uh, using digital design to make jigs and fixtures and tooling um, for me, and it was a real, I, I think, a real test of uh, of the, that skill set for me. Uh, we did have a CNC router and plasma cutter, which was very important. And in a lot of ways, I think of uh, digital design as the best tape measure we're ever going to have. And in a lot of ways, I approach it in the use of my material with a combination of planning and tool making so that I'm still coming sort of in and out of um, the analog and the digital. So I'm make, still bending things by hand, maybe using what you would consider traditional techniques and the experience that I have with materials in a more intimate or craft sense, but uh, partnering it with the complexity that you can get through the digital design and communication. So uh, I'm just gonna run through a few of the projects. Um, maybe not all of them are the best things I've ever made, but you know, they happen so quickly, it's amazing. And I think it ended up being this crucible of experience where I can look back and see 
really the heart and soul of my practice is in these pieces, even that were made so quickly. So where does the inspiration come from? Inspiration is very important to me. And uh, for this first project where we had to make a bed, we could pull from anything. And I pulled from my time here at the Air and Space Museum. Um, I spent two months researching aeronautical design, and I fell in love with the collection of wind tunnel models that they have. Anybody that gets to be in the the, the upper <laughs> uh, floors of, down, of, of the downtown Air and Space Museum, you can see there's just um, hundreds of these beautiful models. And so I pulled that inspiration, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, I, I think of, in the purest sense for me, design is this interconnectivity of things. It's how, what things have in common. And I usually, in a quite honest way, am attracted to things in the world and um, abstract those into my work. So this is a real direct abstraction. Another piece, the challenge laid out, um, was to make something that could live under an umbrella. And I think with this bench, I really, you know, I was really thinking about empathy. I was thinking about the end user in a lot of ways. How would I live with this thing in my own home? And it made me think of this rocking chair that belonged to my grandmother. Um, and she, she used it for many years on her sun porch, and I always think of her when I use it, but I just materially, aesthetically, and in a narrative sense, it, it, I wanted to be able to make something like, that had that same physical experience, but out of an industrial material, because, you know, it's all about mixed messages, right? Um, so empathy, very important for me. Um, honesty, too. Um, one of the challenges was to be inspired by a plate and the design on it, and I gotta say, I just didn't like any of the plates. <laughs> so I chose one at random and did the best I could. <laughs> but it's hard to, um, in a lot of ways, I'm very honest about my inspiration, and, and, and it comes from a very passionate place. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to take an assignment, and maybe that's one of the reasons that I was finding out well, it could be very hard to be getting assignments. Um, I, I work primarily uh, by myself in the studio, so being in this environment where I had to collaborate in such a strong way was uh, an extraordinary experience. Another thing of research, we were asked to, uh, we were given a country and asked to grab something from its history, and I love the brutalist movement, um, so I grabbed that and said, let's run with it, um, bringing it into a wine rack. And I think that's a very important thing for me, too, is research, um, both historical research and this more generalist um, going through the world and being attracted. Um, also, play is incredibly important. Um, we were, I was asked to make a coffee table, and I do play around a lot with materials and models. Just sort of bending it in my hands and seeing what it does is very important. And again, thinking of that idea of moving in between the digital and the analog is that there's always going to be model making and material samples in my life. So really, this is, this is about play in so many ways, of just seeing how they can fit together and how that feels in the end object. So coffee table and a couch. I'd never done upholstery before, so I was glad they brought in an upholsterer. Um, <laughs> in this case, we got four days. Whoa. It felt like a long time at this point. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with this, I really, I really started to think about um, what would I want in my own home and about comfort um, and about the experience. You know, I really love to sit in that cat spot in the corner of a couch. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, all of this was, I, I was starting to think at this point so much more about empathy and experience um, in this sort of cozy way because they said, let, you know, this should be comfortable, right? It was going to be for the green room. And you could see uh, Cliff, who was one of the judges there, he, it was comfy and cozy. But again, I like to have a little trickery and edge in my pieces. So this entire kind of giant couch was really um, pulling from a kind of storytelling um, and that it was very maritime. And I grew up on the coastline, so a lot of my work ends up having that maritime edge to it. Um, so another piece, uh, this one had to be multifunction. Um, so I went back to my air and space time. I really grew up in love with SR the uh, SR-71 Blackbird, you know. Um, and so I was looking into the, really the structure, and engineering is very important to me. I'm in love 
with feats of engineering, bridges and planes and cars, things that are built for speed and strength. Um, and I love them both aesthetically, how they make you feel, but also in their structural sense. So this would move in between a chair and a table and was envisioned to be a group of outdoor pieces. Um, and it very much also, I could almost uh, feel the maritime history in this. Um, as far as the story goes of working with teak and aluminum um, and imagining this really in view of the sea. So also, so all of these different things working together, I think are maybe the heart of how I work. And in a way, the crucible of this intense experience can show that. So abstraction, interconnectivity, empathy, honesty, research, history, play, very importantly, engineering, and in the end, the experience that people have with these pieces. Um, it's, it's interesting to, you know, th to think about what all this, I feel like I'm running anchor here, right? All these things we've been talking about of, are you making a piece that takes 100 hours, or are you making something that takes three days? I think for me, it's most important that it's honest, that it has... Uh, a relationship to risk and uh, dignity, um, that it is following that sort of dream. And I think that was kind of the story that I felt like I was a part of in the show. Um, you were being judged. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and that could be really fun and, uh, and you know, campy. Uh, there could be humor, um, fun being a very important part of it, but also it could be very serious and it could be very harsh and you could find that, wow, you know, I, I could have spent more time on that idea, you know, four hours, you got to think of it quick, but maybe you're making, it, making a wrong choice. And in a lot of ways, I, I thought that was great. You know, I, I, I loved having this feedback and also getting the experience of working with judges that were based around interior design rather than object making. Um, in a lot of ways, I think of myself as an object maker and that's part of my internal persona. Um, but thinking about how they could act with an entire family of objects was quite different for me. And, and I think uh, a lot of that is of this sort of persona, and in a lot of ways being out in the public that far was quite difficult. And in the end, I'm a very private person. And so opening it up to exactly how I felt, um, sharing everything with the world, right down to um, having them meet my wife on TV. She jumped out of a box, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> for those of you who saw it, you know, she didn't know what she was getting into. Um, <laughs> That, that it was really sharing to this enormous audience. And I remember uh, very early on in my career, one, an older woodworker who I wish I remembered uh, his name said, well, you know, woodworking's like a sport. You work real hard, but nobody's cheering for you when you finish that chair. And so I had the total opposite experience. <laughs> um, so in a lot of ways, the producers were... Uh, you know, they wanted to make uh, furniture design into a sport. And uh, in, in how exhausted I was at the end, I definitely say it is a sport. It's sprinting a marathon. Um, all of that work happened in a one month period, including filming. <laughs> and then a nap. Uh, so what does that mean? I, th I think it means, you know, the heart, uh, you know, the heart of a practice doesn't really care how long you spend on the pieces. In a lot of ways, I think being an artist is about reaching, as much as it is about making a single object, it is about being a part of the community. In a lot of ways, um, having had a millions of people see what I do, um, it had a different sort of reach, and I feel like a sort of ambassador to a larger community um, through this than I'd ever thought of before. You know, one of, one of these emails is, is um, from a woman in the Philippines that, you know, recently was watching the show and talking really about inspiration, the, the people who have been, sometimes I get uh, questions of, you know, I want to make my first table, what should I make the legs out of, or where should I go, um, to people telling me about their husband or wife who's sick or trying to conceive, and so all of these different stories, and a lot of it is, is an object maker, a very, uh, very different experience of sharing, right, to the world 
what we do as a community, and when I say we, I think of you know, the crafts or the maker community, is that we fulfill this very, this very important little stitch in society that is about, um, about those ideas of time's up. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> Yay, bye. <laughs> That was my last slide, actually, so close. I wasn't even looking down there. Okay. Can I just point out that Vivian Beer won the Ellen Design Challenge? The soul of modesty as a furniture maker. Uh, okay, so if I could have the uh, panelists come on up to the stage. We are now going to have, we're actually running right on time, which is entirely a tribute to Gloria Kenyon and her timekeeping. So we are now going to have about 45 minutes of discussion with the artists, uh, followed by a 15 minute break, and then I'll offer a few thoughts about the day as a whole. I do think about questions that you may have for our artists after I uh, ask them a few myself. Okay, great, we're live. Uh, so I thought what I would do is just ask each of our makers one question uh, based on their presentations and then we would have a little bit of open discussion. So Wendy, can I start with you since you're next to me? Uh, can you te tell me a little bit about your thoughts about furniture as a political medium? It's very unusual to be using furniture for critique, I realize not all of your work is furniture, but that is part of it. Do you think furniture is a particularly effective way to get a political idea across? Well, I think that it sort of happened organically because it's the one thing that I'm the most familiar with. But um, like I said, it provided opportunities for use, the use of interior space and exterior space and it has the ability to tell a story in, in ways that are pretty unique to furniture. And I think because of my experimentation with this, it allowed me to uh, expand on that and go beyond furniture using just the wood and the string and the paper and so. Do you think that furniture is a way to get inside people's lives in a way fine art maybe is not? I think there's a domestic quality about furniture that may affect a person very differently when they view a piece of political work. If it's um, a familiar form, it may show somebody in a very different way than a pure piece of sculpture, mm. perhaps. Okay, you thank know. you. Uh, Larry, uh, maybe we could move on to you. Uh, it was wonderful to see your presentation, and I think we all felt that Sam's spirit was in the room, and it was great to have that today as part of our symposium. Um, I actually want to ask you to cast your mind back a ways to the point at which you were trained 
to make these amazing pieces of furniture. Um, you know, obviously you have an incredible skill set at this point from the long experience of working in the shop. How did you actually acquire those skills? Was Sam teaching you step by step? Was it imitating him like an apprentice? How did that work? I would say it's um, a little bit of uh, training on his part, but he wasn't um, uh, really fastidious about showing me what to do. Mm -hmm. I kind of observed over his shoulder and kind of paid attention mm -hmm. to very subtle things sometimes about what he was doing. And uh, uh, occasionally he would call me in and really demonstrate a process or something to me, but most of it was just being there and being very attentive. Mm. to what was going on. Mm. Um, to carry that further, I had a 23-year hiatus with Sam. I worked with him seven years or originally, but then mm. I was gone for 23 years with my own business, environmental design. Mm. Worked at a couple of universities during that period in the art departments and uh, acquired a great deal of, of skills in that process. I rejoined him in 1992 uh, because I was visiting and heard the, the uh, freeway was going to go through his compound, through his house. And I decided it was a very good time for me to rejoin him. He was mm -hmm. 75 at that time, and uh, he'd been asking me for years to come back. So the interesting thing is, is when I rejoined him, I had to relearn how to make his furniture. Right. And Mike Johnson was a very uh, pivotal person in showing me the steps to go through to produce those pieces because they were so much incredibly more sculptural at that point. Mm. And so it t I would say it took about a year for me to really settle down and feel absolutely comfortable about uh, mm. doing the pieces that I was working on. The other, very involved. The yeah. other thing I was wondering about is the examples that you showed of extending his designs and doing an alteration on what he had done. I guess the hall stand was the most uh, significant departure, but you would also for example, take an existing chair design and extend it laterally or turn it into a rocker. Right. How do you think about the process of, in a way, um, appropriating or, or meddling with somebody who's such an acknowledged design um, genius? I think after spending that many years with Sam, you really absorb uh, the energy mm. of what he's doing. You really understand it. Um, and I think especially when we went back and introduced the uh, designs from the 1950s, we uh, borrowed original pieces and made patterns uh, and really scrutinized the construction strategy he went through and basically reproduced his mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, that, that, that process is one of a very creative period for him yeah. where he's changing designs and changing ideas radically and rapidly through the 50s. Mm. And so we're jumping into the middle of that and picking out a particular piece that he moved on from. Mm. Um, and so it was, it was a really fascinating time to go through that. And uh, aside from furniture making, I learned a heck of a lot about how Sam's mind was working and mm. how he was developing ideas. Uh, so it was, it was a really important time. But you absorb that, that understanding of the aesthetic language. And so I don't think it's that difficult when you understand that uh, how to apply it to a new concept mm. uh, that somebody asked for, a new piece. Mm. Um, the bottom line is when you're done with it and you look at it, it has the same loop. And if it doesn't, then you do it over or you fix it. You know, right. That's the thing. Okay, um, maybe now moving coast to coast over to Brooklyn and Uhuru. Um, can we talk a little bit uh, about your business, Bill, um, that you run with Jason? Uh, one thing that you mentioned at the beginning uh, was that you just made your 10,000th chair for Shake Shack. There's one across the street, by the way. I don't know if anyone went for lunch. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the experience of working at such large scale and then also doing such uh, kind of bespoke and focused projects because you're really running the whole gamut there. You're almost in mass production. Right. I guess maybe you would call 10,000 mass production. How, how do you, how do you um, I mean, it's not Apple, but still. Yeah. How, how do you uh, sort of arrange that in your mind and construct a business that will work at, at those very different scales? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that we we struggle with, I think, on an almost daily basis, um, really thinking about uh, how everything fits together and how there's like a cohesive um, whole to the, the uh, aesthetic, to the brand, to our ideas of what it should be. Um, the way we usually think about it is we think, you know, we come up generally with these 
collections, like the F New Fold collection and, and the Coney Island, and those sort of serve as kind of like the, the foundation of our work. And then a lot of the other work kind of comes out in iterations of that. So the, the new desking system that we launched uh, uses leg styles borrowed from some of our um, sort of original slab tables where we'll do like a big natural slab or with a metal base. And so we'll bring that language, that materiality into um, something like office products, which is, you know, not as interesting. <laughs> um, and uh, so we'll, we'll, we try and uh, keep the language uh, together through the materiality uh, mm. for the most part of the materials that we use. So we, we tie all that language together, um, as well as sort of the process of, of designing the pieces. We do a lot of collaborative design mm. um, between each other, between clients to come up with the, the pieces that we do. So Bill, you use a lot of reclaimed material. It's a kind of signature of your company. Yeah. I wonder how much you know about the ecological difference there is between doing that kind of work as opposed to working with raw, so-called raw materials? Are you able to quantify that or get a handle um, on it? You know, we, we don't, uh, a lot of the work that we produce, and you know, it's interesting that, because over the you know, last 10 years, as we moved into doing more of the larger scale production, you know, when you do small production um, and you're using either recycled materials or um, you know, sustainably sourced materials, you don't, you know, the imp your impact is small no matter what. Uh, but when you start producing on a, lar a much larger scale, like for Shake Shack, um, you know, if we reduce the tab that holds the seat on, you know, to eighth inch instead of quarter inch bar, you know, we might save, uh, you know, a couple thousand pounds of steel, you know, in a big production run. Mm -hmm. So like that, you know, start to really see like how those differences multiply out. Mm -hmm. um, and you can really start to focus in on how to make um, something that lasts for the, the least amount of impact possible. Mm -hmm. That's becoming so important, isn't it, in all areas of design. Uh, just made me think of uh, airplane design, for example, where if you shave a pound off the airplane, you save some unbelievable amount of yeah. carbon yeah. Uh, cost down the road. So um, that kind of material intelligence is so important, isn't it? Um, OK, Wendell Castle. Uh, there's so many things we could talk about. And Wendell and I have worked a lot together recently on an exhibition that was at MAD called Wendell Castle Remastered, which was a, a really triumphant show and really my favorite thing that happened at the museum in my time there. Um, but one thing uh, we didn't get a chance to hear about in your remarks, which were beautiful to listen to, is the robot. Uh, so a few years ago, you acquired a robot, which is nicknamed Mr. Chips, that does your carving for you. Um, and I know there's so much to say on the subject. Could you, could you give the audience just a little bit of a sense of why the robot has been so transformative for your practice? Sure. Uh, our robot is a, is, a, is a big one. And it will reach 12 feet. It's essentially an arm, so it'll reach 12 feet in every direction, although we're only using 180 degrees. So in other words, it's capable of doing quite large things. But wh why we needed the robot was that I'd been wanting to make larger and larger furniture. Is this on? It is, yeah, if you just speak right into it. Okay, is that better? A little closer? Uh, I've been wanting to make larger and larger pieces and the larger and larger pieces won't go through the door or they won't get onto the elevator. So the obvious answer is you make them come apart. Well, we're making all very organic shapes, which often are uh, one kind of organic shape which kind of mushes in to another organic shape. To take those apart, the connecting surface area is a compound curve and that would to make a compound curve and make the opposite and expect them to fit together that's just not possible and including also putting joinery into it and you know getting the scale right and the balance right and the weight right uh, you can do that easily with the robot so we bought a uh, a 10-year-old robot. And believe it or not, robots are not expensive. Software is enormously expensive. <laughs> and each maker of a robot has their own proprietary code. So your computer won't speak to it. 
so you have to have another program that translates the program that you programmed on your computer, the toolpath, has to translate it into the language of the robot. And robots are not made to do complex work like we do. They're made to do things like uh, just sometimes just pick up things and, and put it over here or weld. In fact, paint. Wendell, am I remembering rightly that your robot had originally been used as a postal sorting yes. machine? The robot we have came from the U.S. Postal Service. So I don't know exactly what it did, but I was assumed it would be used for pick and place, mm. which is a very common use. So, but it, what a robot does is whatever tool you put on the end. I mean, our, our robot could be a 3D printer. <coughs> our robot could carve stone. Uh, it could weld, it could paint. Uh, but what we do is carve. We have a 10 horsepower uh, router mounted on the end with very large collets, like 3 quarter inch shaft collets, so you get really big bits. And it carves. And if you write your program correctly, it gives you exactly what you want. And there are so many things that we could do that I really haven't had a chance to pursue and, and may not ever pursue. Uh, because the language I'm using in, in my work maybe doesn't require that kind of thing. But it, it has freed us to do virtually anything. We can make an organic shaped cabinet that is as weird as anything and have the door fit perfectly mm. in some kind of weird shape. And you wouldn't tackle that. Just one last little question, Wendell, um, and this was uh, brought to my mind this morning when we were chatting, and you pointed out that with a um, computer design, this is not so much the robot, it's the design <coughs> program that you're using in the first place, you can make a left and right matched pair that are exactly symmetrical mirror images of one another, and that strikes me as one example of the way that using technology has enabled you to free up your design vocabulary and do things that you couldn't have conceived before. That's true. I mean, we do some addition pieces where we make, say, a chair and we're going to make eight of them. And, uh, and it's fabulous for that, obviously, because it'd be boring for me, at least, to make eight. I don't want to make eight chairs. I want to make one chair. But we design one chair, we make one chair, and we can just turn the patterns over and make a, the opposite version. And so many of our so-called one-off pieces are actually two. But they're not the same because they're opposites. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I had a chance to visit Wendell's studio in Rochester, and I can say it's one of the most memorable experiences I've had of seeing many, many places of making in the course of my career, but it's really magical what's happening there. Um, Christy, speaking of magical, uh, those videos were so revelatory to see how you were um, able to get these flat patterns to spring out into life. Um, Lots of questions, but the first one I wanted to ask is, how do you envision something of that complexity before you plunge into it? And I'm sure everybody had this experience of thinking, how does she look ahead to the point of having that very simple thing of it coming off the wall? Is it computers? Is it that you have an incredible spatial imagination, uh, some combination? How does that work? Um, I did a lot of origami, actually, when I was trying to figure out the forms and just folding paper and then making small wood models with masking tape on them to make them fold, and then just uh, small mock-ups. So it was actually hand experimentation yeah, that got you there? definitely. Um, I mean, the, the, the idea to make them digitally didn't come until later. I was trying to make them by hand at first, hmm. and then I realized that I needed a laser cutter and I needed to learn some CAD software, so that kind of came right. later. Another thing that struck me uh, very forcefully is that you've been using ornament in your work, uh, not just in the most recent things which are based on traditional marquetry, but even in the earlier pieces. For example, you might have an image of a blue folding chair mm -hmm. that was on a folding chair and then it would be broken up into visual parts when you unfolded the piece. What is your um, thinking about ornament and its role in your work? Well, for the first pieces, I wanted to sort of camouflage them on the wall. Um, so I actually put, like, try to mimic wallpaper patterns uh. on those pieces because they hung on the wall. And the wallpaper patterns were actually um, rotated and mirrored uh, 
drawings of origami mm. to kind of mimic the, the origami folds as well. Right. Um, as, as my work has progressed, I think more about, well, in the final pieces, it was kind of automated, <coughs> the patterns I was choosing. And then in the large e-waste project with the um, uh, circuit board pattern in it, it was more along the lines of thinking I wanted to make something uh, very traditional looking in in the sort of the, the big uh, scheme of its style, but then as you got closer, know that you know it was um, uh, different. It was a different motif, and it was you know you could kind of tell that it was um, small circuit boards. And it's funny because I had this piece in a show, um, and it was it was a woodworking show. It was a huge woodworking show in San Diego, um, but it was at the fair. It was a, the biggest woodworking show in the U.S. I think at the San Diego fair, and I was there for a while and listening to people come up to it and things like that. And they would step away from it and they would say, "Wow, that's amazing! It's so big and intricate." And then they would get up close. And they would say, well, what is that? Is that circuit boards? And then they would say, oh, it's done with a laser. That's cheating. Right. <laughs> and we'll get back to that in a second, because the next question I want to ask of the whole panel is about that, that <laughs> idea of technology being somehow an unfair assist. Um, but one last question. I was very intrigued by your use of Google search terms as a kind of randomizer in your work, which reminded me of the long history of chance operations and the arbitrary and uh, contemporary art, maybe going back to Duchamp, let's say. Um, what is your specific interest in introducing that element of chance? And I guess it's actually not chance because it's indicating what's actually in the public realm. But why did you decide to make that artistic move? Um, it was more thinking of an automation process, like um, a, an assembly line, Fordism or something like that. Mm -hmm. And because we were starting to have conversations at the time about digital manufacturing and um, basically how it's, you know, it's not a real craft process. I wanted to push that to the edge and say, well, the artist is completely taken out of this besides, besides the fact of uh, saying, this is how I want the work to be done. Anyone could have done it for me. Anyone could have put it together um, and done all the, the automation in finding the the pattern and things like that. So it was kind of just to ask the question, where, where's the line um, between oh. art and manufacturing? That's so interesting because, of course, what chance operations often have been about in art is removing your authorship. So mm -hmm. when you know Duchamp makes a line by dropping a piece of string, and then he uses that as his line for a number of different pieces, he was doing the same thing. And it's like you've updated that for the 21st century. So that's totally fascinating. Um, thank you. Uh, so lastly, Vivian, what's Ellen like? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you, can, you can say a bit if you want, yeah. but I do have a real question. She's lovely. Yeah, of course she is. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about making a spectacle, because here you are, you've been, in some ways, you could say, in the belly of the beast. And I have been on a TV show once, too, in England. Fortunately, none of you have seen it. It's not very good. But I know what it's but like. But now we can look for it. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> right. it's like the old saying, you know, um, there's a couple of things you never want to be, see being made, sausage and politics. And TV definitely is in that list. Um, so it, it's a highly staged uh, experience, what you, you actually see on the screen. What do you think about putting making into that kind of let's say, artificial situation? Well, uh, it's artificial to a point. Um, and then it's just is what it is, the same way going to the studio is every day. Um, and in a lot of ways, it was like setting up an experiment. Um, and then they just ran around us <coughs> with cameras. And I tried not to hit them with sparks, you know. <laughs> so your part's quite real, actually. I, I think it was yeah. quite real. I mean, uh, you know, one of, actually one of the things, uh, uh, one of the conversations I had with one of the executive producers, um, he was talking to us and he said, you know, if I had a brand, it'd be that I'm the guy that cares. You know, we're not looking to make a TV show about people having a meltdown. We're not looking to have a TV show where we're trying to pit people against each other. You know, we're looking to show something special, you know. 
Uh, and, oh, well, of course, I think furniture making is special. But I also think um, there's a certain thirst um, to see how things are made. Um, and this, is, this, this was very much connected um, to the DIY uh, movement and that it was on HDTV, um, which is you know, also DIY channel. Um, so it's accessing people's uh, attraction to what, what is, a, is a person that has a studio and does this for a living that I take for granted, that I have a creative lifestyle. You know, and that that sort of um, uh, time disappears. I, that mention of time runs differently for makers stuck in my head. Yeah. Um, and it does, you know, it runs differently. The motivations are different. Uh, so I, it, it is hard thinking about the immediacy. It's the most immediate of forms. You know, this, the, you do know it's old news now, right? <laughs> okay. um, but there's, you know, I, I, going into it, I was just thinking, well, I'll just be myself mm. and hope for the best. And I, I felt uh, that I was portrayed as I am mm. in a lot of ways. So uh, I'm excited to watch next season rather than... <laughs> but, <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, hopefully it'll continue. And it could be really great for the field. I mean, how many times do you have a billboard about furniture in Times Square? That's right. That's new. Right. So... Um, I'm intrigued by the analogy you made to sports in this context because, of course, sports um, is one of the things that's out there in the public realm that you can't spin. Like, you know, uh, the fastest runner is the fastest runner, and that's all there is to it. And, of course, some sports have an element of subjectivity to them. But it seems to me like the short time frame that you were given, which does, as you say, run against this David Pye you know, it, it takes as long as it takes, and in this case it was no, it takes three days, and not no more. And I wonder whether you found that objectivity or that kind of hard f deadline actually to be helpful in some ways creatively, or if it was just stressful. Uh, I, I think in a way it could be helpful. You had to throw out the, uh, I mean, I think any, any time I make a new body of work, I'm, I make a bunch of ugly ducklings before the yeah. beautiful thing, or or as uh, in Wendell's comments he was talking about, you know, you've got to crunch a lot of things in between your teeth before something really good comes out. Um, and maybe, maybe the short deadline, some of the ugly ducklings made it through, and, and, but maybe, you know, for some of them it was just, okay, it made it a, a quicker gesture in a lot of ways. Right. Um, so that I wasn't, I, you know, I think the biggest thing as far as a maker was the, the thought that I have made a career of using technique in the way that I'm treating material to lend its value. Mm. So concrete, metal, paint. That we're not talking bronze, we're not talking uh, uh, wenge, we're not talking marble. Mm. You know, we're talking about uh, really quite ubiquitous and in a way inexpensive materials. But by the way I was using them in a very practical sense, because all I had was time and no money yeah. when I first started out, by the way I was using them, I was giving them value. And in a lot of ways, by taking away the time that it would take to do that, I had to be making work in a very different way than I ever have before, um, that trying to have the value be in the inspiration of the design, mm. you know, in the way that the parts were interlocking, in the story that the forms, the different forms interacting told rather than the story being in the material and in the kind of value of the labor. Mm. In a lot of ways that's changed the way I'm thinking about really the next few bodies of work. That because I'm it places right emphasis now. on your intellectual capital as a designer in a way. Yeah, and I mean in a way some of the other, the, some of the conversation of value that was happening today of you know, making, making something that takes a thousand hours and it needs to cost enough that I can eat, right? Yeah. Um, and then thinking of, well, okay, how many chairs can, does Shake Shack need? You know, there's, there's got to be something in between that. And why can't, as makers, designers, why can't we be both? Mm. And doesn't that add value? If I can take the meaningful experiences I've had in, in the sort of, uh, you think of that time-consuming labor-intensive work and bring it to the design and the sensitivity that I'm, that I'm interacting with cheating, you know, right? We're all cheating with the digital. I don't think it's cheating, you know? Why can't we be both? 
Well, that is the next point I wanted to ask about. Although the, the, I, I will say the last thing you just said about being a designer and maker both. We should remember that, of course, Sam Maloof was in the California designer craftsman in the 1950s, and that's where he started, and that was the ethos that he came out of. So a lot of good things come from that combination, for sure. But can I ask the panel for your thoughts about technology now? You said, Christy, that sometimes people would say to you, um, oh, it's laser cut, so that's cheating. And I know Wendell from experience that some people would walk through your show at MAD, and they would say, well, which ones did he actually make? <laughs> and I would say, that's not necessarily the right way to look at it. But what do you all think about the values that, that are placed on technology in the furniture field today? Uh, and do you think we have the right attitudes to it? Are there changes that you would like um, in the way that people are approaching, uh, approaching this new set of tools? Yeah, Wendell. Don't forget the mic, Wendell. Forgot about that. <laughs> when, we, when we first started to use the robot after learning how to use it and could do complex things, the galleries I deal with were a little reluctant to want to talk about it. I'm like, let's don't talk about the robot. <laughs> because they were nervous that that might take something away from the value. But they've gotten over that. That's not the case anymore. It's changed quickly, hasn't it? Yes, um, it changed very quickly. Certainly with your work. Yes. It's become a point of fascination, in fact, I think, for yes. many people. Bill, you said uh, Yeah, Larry. yeah well, I, I mean, I think as makers, you know, it is our responsibility. I mean, we are making a product um, that people are buying. And, you know, our, it's our responsibility to make the best product that we can um, with what's available. Um, but also, you know, to bring along the, the, the craft culture and the history, too. So, I mean, for us, we like to, to mix traditional craft techniques with digital as much as we can, um, really just highlighting both, both of those as important. And um, what, what kind of feedback do you get from your clients? Do they care whether you're using technology or not? I, I mean, I think, uh, I think they're, they're, I would say, like, the feedback I haven't heard anything critical. It's it's more excitement that something. Oh, this is laser cut. Oh wow! Like, how does that? You know, okay. like yeah. because they know that we're also you know at least the pieces that we make from our studio that the we're we're making them um, one by one as well. You know, it's not um, that we're just sending everything out and getting it back and then getting it to them. Yeah. Um, okay, Larry, you you mentioned your ten digits. What's yeah, your, what's right. your perspective uh, on this? My personal feeling is, is that I, I find value, the real value in, of any of this is in the, the creative process itself. That's where um, I really enjoy being an artist and just going through the disparate kind of association and, and synthesis of information and experience that creates a piece. And um, so my feeling is uh, it doesn't really matter to me what I use to make something. You know, that the end result, uh, obviously, we, like Bill says, we want to create something beautiful and, and, and useful uh, spiritually, but um, the end result is kind of an afterthought of that process that yeah. I enjoy going through. I had an interesting experience at Anderson Ranch Art Center this summer. I was teaching a, a wood class up there for two weeks. And in, in the adjacent room, uh, there was a young man named Ruben Fote who was teaching the CNC class. Yep. Um, I didn't really know much about uh, his history or what he was teaching, and I never had much interest in looking into that because I come from old school, hands-on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but when I <coughs> talked to him, the course of talking to him, and then I looked at his website, and it was awesome what he was doing. Yep. And it totally opened up a whole new thinking process for me yep. in, in having that experience. So. Even though I'm very traditional in the way I like to work, I've always worked in my hands, and and um, my life is wrapped around a, a number 49 Nicholson Rath. Uh, I look to the future. I don't know how this is going to work in for me ultimately, but I see no problem with it in terms of, of making beautiful things. Great. Okay. Uh, Wendy, you were going to say something. So from an educational point of view, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with technology and trying to keep up with it. I mean, 
find one I would shop for the last 35 years, you know, with a lot of energy to keep that facility up to date. And then all of a sudden, digital technology comes along, and you get the students say, oh, I want a CNC machine. Oh, I want a laser cutter. And the challenges are not only finding money for these things, but also finding the space for them. Uh, finding, we had to find a teacher because now that's not something that I could pick up very easily. But it's, it's a great thing. The, the challenge is also getting students to learn how to use the old stuff properly first, rather than relying on CNC to cut those perfect circles. It would be nice to see them execute it equally well on a bandsaw, for example. Right, so you're, you're asking the student to accept it as an added mm -hmm. technique rather than a replacement technique. It's easy for them to want to skip that other yeah. step. Yeah, so. which has so many other parallels <laughs> right, for right, today's right. generation, of course. But I value it. I think um, it's made industrial processes available to, to the small craftsmen. Mm. Uh, we can do things more efficiently, mm. more quickly. Um, the technology of water jet cutting glass so I can embed a video monitor inside the glass. I mean, uh, in the old days, we had to sandblast that glass away. So those, those kinds of processes are just invaluable. Mm. But I think they need to go hand in hand. Mm. You know. I just one quick thing when I heard before you... Mike Wendell. <laughs> that I was asked recently in, in an interview what's my favorite tool in the shop? And I'm sure they, they expected to hear the robot, but they did not. My answer was a pencil. <laughs> That's great. That's where it all starts, right? Uh, Christy and Vivian, did you have anything to? Uh, yeah, actually, what Wendy was just saying about the students coming in um, who didn't know anything and they wanted to jump right into the CNC router and the laser cutter, um, I think that's really interesting, and and that's something I really believe in is that you need to learn how to use, um, you know, the regular hand tools first. I was speaking to someone I can't remember. I think they were a shop tech at an architecture school somewhere recently, and they said that um, a lot of the architecture students they come in and they draw models and they use CAD software, and then they'll cut something on the laser or the CNC router or whatever. And a lot of her students, she said, were saying um, that you can only make this with the CNC router. This could never be hand cut because they didn't know how to hand cut it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Some misinformation there. Yeah. Uh, Vivian? Uh, well, I think there's a couple of things. One is a demystification of uh, digital design and fabrication is still hard, too. Like that robot, not easy to put together. I'm sure there were thousands of hours setting that up. The uh, manual was over a thousand pages. So um, it, it kind of isn't cheating. It's just another way. And as somebody that deals in a lot of compound curves as well, um, I, I, you know, you could do them by hand, but there's some things that you really need those assessment tools for. Yeah. Um, and there's if if the finish line is extraordinary, extraordinary objects or experiences, right? Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to get there, and and you know we should we sh in the same way that uh, say none of us have had to submit slides for a really long time, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean photography doesn't exist anymore, but it also means digital media is a good idea, you know, and, and any kind of technological development as it gets absorbed into the arts, it's used in creative ways, it's used in efficient ways, and it's it's in the end always, I think, a good thing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so before I turn it over to the audience, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the future of furniture, which of course is the theme for the day. So leaving technology aside, because we've just had a good talk about that, what else do you see as the potential for 
yourselves as makers, but also for the next generation of makers coming along? Where do you think the action is going to be, the change, the transformation is going to be in the field in the next 10, 20 years or longer? First, yeah. First of all, I don't, I don't really think of myself as a furniture maker. Uh, and my work is not marketed and sold as furniture. Mm -hmm. It's sold in an art gallery. And the venues that it goes to are art venues. And so the functional aspect of it, to me, is not very important. Mm -hmm. But I believe that if you're making a chair, that you should be able to sit in it, but you don't have to be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I think Witold made that point this morning, too. Yeah. Other thoughts on the future? I think there's going to be huge changes. Um, you know, we've talked about technology, but as a pile of makers, all we talked about is tools. Um, we didn't talk about social media. We didn't talk about the internet. Um, and having had this experience with Spectacle, um, an introduction to what that relationship to um, persona and fame can do for or against you or whatever. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, even making the joke about slides, it was very expensive to apply to something at one point. You had to, yeah. I'm on the very tail end of being old enough to have had to make slides, right? Um, and it was hard and it was expensive, but now you can start an Instagram handle and become famous enough to start a studio, right? Yeah. So that's a very, very different um, uh, climate, I think, to come to as a maker, you know, and, and, you know, thoughts of, do you need to go through a formal education? No, not necessarily. Will it help? Maybe. Who knows? Um, I think the, the, the arts field is blown out enormously when it comes to social media and its role in how um, how we find what we want to spend our money in on, you know what I mean, too, yeah. is, uh, and, and in the end, as professionals, it is, in, you know, this conversation of commodity, as much as it's a very, it can be a very soulful experience to be a maker, at the same time you're doing it as a living, and the way that that is happening, I think, has changed a lot, mm -hmm. especially in, in, in the last five years, is an accelerating mm -hmm. force, you know what I mean? Absolutely. All right. I think in terms of the, the work that I'm used to creating at, at Maloof, um, there was a lot of conversation earlier today about that 1%, and uh, that's basically our clientele. Sure. And so with anything, uh, value is a, is a consent issue. And as long as there's a consent that this value persists, uh, there'll be a f f future for that kind of furniture. Mm -hmm. um, but that's... Uh, kind of a fickle way to look at it. But basically, that's what it's about. Mm. OK, anything else on this topic, future? Uh, well, I'll just, um, I think, uh, as Vivian was saying, you know, the reach is so much greater now with the digital, other digital tools of the internet and social media. And um, I think no. that you know, we, as makers, like, need to, you know, because it's so much more accessible in a way, like, we need to, to keep thinking about like, what um, our value is that we add um, with what we make. And I think um, you know, that comes through the design. And, and one thing that, that Wendell said that really, I think, uh, which we think about too, is when you design on the computer, it, it, can, um, it can really look like it's designed on the computer. And I just think that, um, you know, I hope that it's maintained that, that things are still made. And I think that, that maker movement and the kind of digital movement are going to collide. Yeah. And hopefully it'll be a nice mixture of the two. Um, and one, you know, sort of won't overtake the other. Great. It's just an observation. But furniture lasts such a long time. It, increasingly, I've been seeing going into homes and uh, younger people who have the collections are actually They've actually inherited the Nakashima Maloof. I even saw one the caricature in Tom Lowe's home, who he inherited from his parents. And so I'm only thinking that is there going to be room for more studio furniture? <laughs> 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 you know, or is, 
and how much is the art fair market shaping or not shaping the potential of studio furniture? Uh, when you read about the art fair, it's always the same people that I see time and time again, mostly from Europe. Many of the work that we saw this morning are the ones that I'm most familiar with from at the art fair in Europe and in Florida. And so I'm, I, I don't really have an answer. I'm just making an observation about where our market is and uh, do we have to wait until the millennials get older? <laughs> or, or, you know, I'm just curious. To, uh, I don't know, but I try not to worry about it from my perspective because over the last 40 years, I've seen the market fluctuate. It's cyclic. It comes back up and then it goes down, and and I'm I'm a believer that that's the way yeah. the world operates. But it is interesting, and this hadn't occurred to me before you said that, Wendy. But actually, in the group of people we have here, we not only have six very different makers, but we have six different business models. Everything from somebody who's carried himself as an artist for many decades, shows and galleries, to small batch production what you might call a more traditional apprenticeship role that carries on studio furniture. Um, Christy, you're thinking about crowdsourcing now and these digital platforms of creation. You're a TV star. So there's, <laughs> <laughs> so th there's, there's obviously a lot of possibility in the field just in terms of the way that one is going to make a career in furniture. And probably that's one thing we can expect to continue is uh, ongoing fragmentation and the simultaneity of these different possibilities moving forward, uh, which is very exciting. So can we, um, no, um, we'll we would need to stop session. now. Okay, um, sure. And save your question. We will okay. have a question and answer session after the presentation. Sure. Um, but let's take a quick 15 minute okay. break. We'll be right here for the end of the day after the Thank you. Thank okay. You. Great, guys. Thanks. So Sorry, I thought we would do the question. It's a good one. Yeah. So should I? I think my summation would be Yeah. How do you do it? I'm not fine. 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 I'm not fine.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to take your seats again. So thanks for sticking with us for the uh, whole length of the day. I know it's a long day, but uh, so much great uh, material has been presented, and, and I really feel like we've seen the cream of the crop of thinking uh, in this field, not only in terms of makers, but also theorists and indeed institutions. And I thought I would just give you in my closing remarks today some reasons to be cheerful about furniture. As Nora said this morning, there has been a lot of bad news in the world um, over the last year and more. And sometimes when craft-based events like this one happen, uh, there can be a tendency to be pessimistic. But I myself am an incurable optimist, and particularly when it comes to questions about making and material intelligence, which of course is so completely exemplified by the folks that we've had up here on stage today. And I think that our reasons to be cheerful certainly start at home with the Renwick. I, I mentioned earlier that uh, Nora has been doing such a fantastic job there, as you can see in the present installations, and also Abraham Thomas, my great friend from London, has just been appointed as the curator in charge at the Renwick, which is fantastic news. So, uh, so you can see, um, you'll see more exciting things happening there very soon. I also just wanted to say that on the strength of this morning's presentation, I can say that Haystack is in very good hands as well. Is Paul in the room? Paul Securities? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I knew Stu Kestenbaum very well. I'm sure a lot of you did. And I, like many people, wondered how on earth Haystack would ever find somebody that could replace him, somebody with that warmth of spirit and humanity, with such a great understanding of the place. And uh, having been there only for a few months, Paul has already been able to completely become in tune with that great organization. So I'm really glad you're there, Paul. Uh, and similarly, I would say the same for the Maloof Foundation, which has brought us all here today. And I think they've shown great spirit in doing so and, and vision in coming all the way to the uh, to the right coast and um, and bringing us together. So reasons to be cheerful, certainly on an institutional level, but I think also on a cultural level when it comes to furniture. And I've been thinking a lot over the course of the day about what I might say and the phrase that leapt out to me a few times, and I probably did for you as well, is this question, do we need another chair? This is actually not, this, this, is, this is not the first time I've heard that at a conference. At the VNA. I was once at a symposium that included the fantastically interesting Eindhoven-trained maker, Joris Larman, and he was asked that question from the audience, and it was a sort of ecologically motivated thing. Do we need to be putting more chairs out into the world? And he said, isn't that a little like asking, do we not need to write any more songs? <laughs> Which I thought was such a wonderful way to put it. Uh, but what he's getting at there is that there's something about furniture that is ineffably human. And of course, each generation needs to make their own environment. Each generation needs to find and make their own furniture. And there's even something you might say about chairs in particular, which I think was really brought out well by Withhold this morning uh, implicitly, which is that of course they are anthropomorphic and they envelop us. They're almost like another body supporting our body. They are, from another point of view, created almost as, um, as a kind of yin to our yang, a shape that fits into us perfectly, rather like two of Wendell's compound curves fitting perfectly together. And a good chair will give you that feeling, Maloof's above all, if you've ever had a chance to sit in one of them. So in some way, a chair, even in use, but especially in terms of the production of them by a maker, somehow defines what it is to be human, the value of being human, the limits of being human. And so even if it is true that chairs don't necessarily index historical change in the way that other things might, and I'm here thinking about Michael's talk this morning, and also this idea that we have that our age might be defined by technology and what a smartphone can do, whereas a chair might be around from 300 years ago and we're still using it perhaps, and might last for 200 years. So it doesn't seem like a very sensitive register of historical change, and that line uh, of Kubler's that um, ever since the morning of uh, of mankind, we've only had replicas and variants. That's that's fair, certainly. But at the same time, the idea of a chair as something that expresses ourselves seems 
to me to be much more um, true than the supposedly more expressive phenomena that happen on the screen of my smartphone. And of course, a smartphone is trying to express you all the time. That's what it's designed to do. It's a neutral portal that allows you to explore anything that you want. You can dress it up with all sorts of features and apps. You can customize it to an extent that you've never been able to customize probably any product in the history of the world exactly to what you want and what you are. But I would suggest to you that in that very infinity of possibility, that object actually falls far short of what something like a chair can say about you. And I think it's because a chair is after all a repository of thousands of years of human ingenuity. You know, we say a phone is smart, but what's really smart is an object that is descended to us from uh, time and memoriam of improvements, technological experimentation, generation after generation after generation, thinking what this very, very simple form could be made to be. And I, I can't imagine ever using that up. I think, it, I think it's a repository of material intelligence that will stay with us uh, for a very long time. And this is why I often when I, when I speak these days, will ask people to just pay a little bit of attention to the thing that they're sitting in right at that moment. And I don't know if you've been doing that today, because this is a symposium about furniture, maybe you actually have. But most of the time when I say that, audience members sort of look down and they notice that they've been sitting in this thing for four hours and they nev it's never occurred to them even for a minute to wonder what materials are in it, where it was made, who might have made it, what its ecological impact might have been. And to me that bespeaks a culture that is in many ways profoundly out of tune with its material environment in ways that probably are new, ways that speak to the distraction of technology and the, the fact that we're always being pulled into our devices and pulled away from the material environment that surrounds us that actually was put together and put there by people after all. So I think furniture is a great example of this. It's not a unique example. Certainly you could say the same thing about the plates that we eat off, the forks that we eat with, the building that surrounds us, the art that we hang on our walls. But all of these material expressions of human value are extremely precious and we should remember that even as they are transformed by technology, they also connect us to something that is, that is really essential. Another thing that I, I was thinking about this morning that popped into my head was a book called The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Do people know this book? Um, yeah. Um, so this was published long enough ago that it was a major text for me as I was growing up. And it's one of those things that I don't remember reading for the first time. It goes that far back into the mists of time, kind of like Charlie Brown Christmas. Have you heard the last talk I gave here? Um, it's a, a kind of you know primary text for me, you might say. Um, and the plot goes like this. Um, there's a boy who has an apple tree and he grows up playing in the branches of the apple tree. So he climbs up into the tree and he swings from the branches and the tree loves him and he loves the tree. And as the boy grows older, he starts to have needs. So first he needs money and he goes to the tree and says, I need money. And the tree says, well, take my apples and sell them. So the boy takes the apples and he sells them and he doesn't see the boy for a while. And then the boy comes back and the tree uh, inquires after him and he said, and he says, well, I don't need um, apples anymore, but I need somewhere to live. And so the tree says, well, take my branches and build a home. So he cuts all the branches off the tree and takes them away. And so now the tree is just a naked uh, trunk. And the boy is gone for a very long time. And then he comes back and the tree asks after him and the boy says that he um, needs to go away on a long journey, but he has no boat. And so the tree says, well, take my trunk and you can turn it into a boat. And he cuts the tree just a few inches off the ground, maybe eight, 10 inches off the ground. And he takes the trunk and he carves it into a boat and he sails it away. And he's gone for a very, very long time. The tree doesn't think he's coming back. And finally he does come back and he's an old man. This boy is now grown up. And the tree says, I'm sorry, I have nothing left to give you. And the boy says, well, now I'm very old and tired and all I want to do is rest. And he sits on the stump. And that was what I was thinking of when uh, we heard the line this morning, a chair is what we need when we don't need anything at all. Which, when you first hear that line, sounds a little bit like 
you know, how important could it be then? It sounds like it's a luxury, which brings us back to Michael's lecture about the 1% and the fact that all of these designs are being made for this elite class and that inserts furniture right into this political dynamic that we've all been talking about, all been thinking about this year, not only in this country, but in Europe as well, of course, and elsewhere in the world. And the line, a chair is what we need when we don't need anything at all, could make it seem just like a luxury product. Why don't we just sit on the ground? Why don't we devote ourselves to something more essential and, and functional, perhaps? Um, but viewed another way, we could say that a chair is what we need when we don't need anything at all, points to the fundamental philosophical importance of furniture. In fact, philosophy is another thing that we need when we don't need anything at all, when you come to think of it. And yet it's one of the most important human activities that we engage in. And I would say the same thing uh, for furniture. Um, the last thing I, I just wanted to say is about the concept of the future. And here I'll uh, quote another thing that I, I ran across recently, which takes us back to 1939 and the World's Fair in New York. And as many of you know, they made a time capsule for the 1939 World's Fair, and it was quite an enterprise. They gathered together typical objects of all kinds uh, to express what life in 1939 was like. They um, collected examples of all the languages in the world in case when the time capsule was excavated, which was supposed to be 5,000 years in the future, in case all the languages had been lost. And they um, even provided a universal translation key which was uh, done by simply translating the Lord's Prayer. It was 1939, so the Lord's Prayer was considered to be the key text for America um, at that time. And so they translated the Lord's Prayer into every language so that you could use it as a translation key to understand how all these languages fit together. Um, and the other thing that they did was to gather comments from luminaries from around the world, uh, asking them to say something to the future. And Albert Einstein was one of the luminaries that they chose, and he wrote this fantastic thing that said that uh, life in 1939 was in many ways good, but in some ways problematic. For example, uh, people in different countries kill each other at regular intervals, was one of the things he said. And many people live in fear of um, economic, um, of falling off the economic cycle. So things that again seem kind of familiar to us today. But he ended his comment with this wonderful line, which is, um, I hope I can get this right. I trust that posterity will read these lines with a proud and justified superiority. <laughs> so wonderful to read that now, because of course we are posterity for 1939, we are that world ahead that he was looking forward to. But do we actually read his words and the experience of the late 1930s, of course, knowing as we know now what he could not know then, which is that World War II was about to happen, thinking of Wendy's uh, presentation earlier, of course. Um, do we read those lines with a proud and justified superiority? Do we look at any moment in time in the past with a proud and justified superiority? After all, we are just as in the dark about what may be coming as people were then and as, as people always have. We are stuck in the present and that's never going to change. So it seems to me that all we can do is to live in that present with the highest degree of awareness and humanity that we possibly can. And that really brings me back to where I started because I think it's the institutions that we build, the Maloof, the uh, Haystack, a museum like this one, the Renwick Gallery, and it's through the choices that we make, whether they're economic or aesthetic, expressive, intellectual, theoretical, mathematical, engineering, um, televisual, all of these choices that we make are our means of situating ourselves within history. And I think that furniture is always going to be one of the essential ways that we do that. It's simply the case that we can be either more or less aware of how we're doing that. And it's events like this that hopefully heighten awareness and allow us to speak to our own posterity with a, a little bit more, um, a little bit more kindness and humanity and generosity. Uh, so those are a few thoughts on the day. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, and then um, if I could ask our panel to, uh, from this afternoon to come on, on up to the, um, to the stage, uh, we can have Q&A and wrap up the day. Thank you very much. So artists to the front again, please.
For questions, if you could please raise your hand and wait until we bring the microphone to you. This program is being webcast, so it's helpful for those at home who are watching to be able to hear what you are asking. And I'll take questions too if you have any, of course. Okay, all assembled. Okay, does anyone have any questions to start us off? Yes. You've talked a lot about chairs. There's lots more to furniture than chairs. In fact, some cultures don't even use chairs. So I wonder um, if we can talk a little bit about the sort of concept of furnitureness in general, mm. as opposed to just focusing on chairs. Yeah, that, I might have been guilty of uh, playing my motif a little hard there, but, um, and in fact, Wendy, you don't really make chairs very much at all, no. hardly ever. Uh, so so that's, that's a fair point, furniture is a big world. Um, do you, uh, as a panel, have any thoughts on the difference between making chairs and other kinds of furniture and how they fit into your work? Yes, Wendell. I believe there's something much more personal about a chair than other pieces of furniture. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting, you're, you're handling it, uh, you're touching it, you, you feel the texture, and you, you're just very close to a chair. Or, you know, a cabinet, I don't know, I don't fondle a cabinet uh, or a table. But there's another aspect to it. There are a lot of collectors of chairs. Very important, big collections of chairs. I've never heard of a table collector. I've never <laughs> heard of a cabinet collector. Or, uh, there's more opportunities with chairs. Mm. I think each type of furniture has its own psychological impact if you're thinking about it um, within the space. Uh, you know, chairs, we love them, I love them, it's hard not to talk about them, are quite different than tables, quite different than cabinets. I feel like, Wendy, you and a lot of your students too have um, done a lot of work. Um, I'm thinking of the Cabinets of Curiosity show you did, a lot of work with cabinets and using them um, as you know, psychological art pieces, like is a space of that exterior interior that you were talking about. That's like different psychology, but mostly I think the most important theme of furnitureness is its um, accessibility uh, to people. And I think uh, no matter how wild a piece of furniture is, it's very accessible because it's something you can own. And I'm gonna mm. I think about that as a positive thing about commodity is ownership can be positive of seeing I can own that cabinet, I can have it in my home, I can have an intimate experience with it, and I get to understand it because I own it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an accessibility that we have as furniture makers to do something, um, well, to, it's tricky form of art, you know, like you can, you can do whatever you want because people are going to accept that it's time to sit in that thing whether it's comfortable or not, <laughs> whether it's crazy or not, because they see it as the identity of chair or the identity of cabinet. I'm gonna open that drawer even if it's gonna bite me or even if it does trick me into fondling it. And that's, that interactivity, um, I, it gives us something quite different than other forms of art, I think. Um, I was going to say that, that uh, another aspect coming from our tradition when I worked with Sam in the 60s, uh, traditionally, we would make a whole set of furniture or a whole room of furniture for a client. Yeah. We'd make a table, chairs, a chest, sideboard, hutch, maybe a rocking chair for the other room or something like that. So Sam was expressing himself in a, in a great dimension of, of creativity. Um, as time progressed, uh, say like through into the 80s, when the whole attitude towards collecting kind of switched, uh, where people were collecting individual pieces from different artists. So you mm. get a table from one individual and you get chairs from another. And mm. So you're collecting names and, and work from different artists. Sam gradually became known as a chair maker. And there's a lot of 
people right now that think of him only as a chairman. Yeah. And uh, originally, uh, he was very gifted. It was one of his strongest gifts in, in designing casework and, and those kinds of pieces, which he rarely did toward the end of his career. Mm. It's the sort of skewing effect, not only of individual collecting, but also, I have to say, of museums. I mean, I can tell you from experience that a museum finds it much easier to represent an artist with a chair than a table, for sure, and less so with a cabinet, just for reasons of space, both display and storage space. But we should remember, and it's a, I'm really glad you asked the question because it's a good corrective. You know, in 17th century France, which many people accept as the highest uh, level of furniture production in, in European history, the elite furniture makers were called cabinet makers. They, the chair makers were a much less exalted breed and much less highly compensated and cabinets were, of course, um, you know, a much more complicated endeavor at that time with many more materials, precious materials, etc. So it is a, a good corrective, so thanks. Another question, yeah. I think one of the other things that makes furniture special is memory. Uh, I remember pieces that why we bought them, when we got them, maybe they take generations, and they carry those memories on. When we moved from our house and sold it to our children, our memories stayed there. And I think of them every time I go back to the house. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the, and, and get a reaction on is, some inside the chairs, they're, they're not necessary because after all the human body is made to lie down or stand up. But in fact, they're essential precisely because <coughs> the human body is not made to sit down. And that what's, is what makes them a challenge. Yes. Uh, wait. Just hold on to the, for the mic okay. if you don't mind. Okay. Speaking of posterity, we need us all recorded. So. I would like to know what the furniture people you, who work in wood are doing about the re-establishment of forests, whether it be teak in Indonesia, other woods in South America, etc. There is a diminishing supply. What is happening? Is there a movement to restore, to rejuvenate, to replant any of these areas? So, um, the, yeah, the, the question is, uh, what are furniture makers doing about the depletion of forests? So the loss of timber and the ecological problems of over-harvesting timber. I think that is something you're interested in, isn't it, Wendy? Yeah. Not just elephants. To, just sort of by default, because uh, I was using less precious wood in the Japanese-American theory simply because that was the material that they used to build this prison enclosures. And they didn't uh, just tar paper and pine and fur. But I think the character of the word is really part of the, the message that you're trying to send. Um, I did make a piece out of Paul Farrell. That was probably the most precious word that I've ever used. But I think it was to identify with the type of word that they used in China. Uh, I was trying to draw a parallel between what influenced that piece and the choice of word was important to make that cohesive enough. But as far as deforestation and I mean that's another topic maybe that's going to be my next theory but it, that's a very complicated subject for us woodworkers I think um, we change the way we work with wood uh, we try to use the most that we can um, but we can't compare, you can't compare the way we use wood with the industry of the kind of material that you see building, the building, Home Depot, and they go through so much material that it's got to start, I know, wider based, it's not just studio furniture makers, but 
industry, I think, need to be more conscientious about the use of wood. Mm. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Bill, and then Wendell. Oh. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, something like the you know production of paper uses way more wood. Than, oh, the you know production of paper, for example, uses a lot more wood than than, than furniture makers would ever use. Um, you know, for us, we use uh, sustainably harvested wood, FSC certified, or you know, like storm storm felled trees, um, trees that are are um, are sick or at the end of their lifespans. Um, but I think that's a good question, though. I think we could, I don't know, do more to in the reforestation effort, which I think was the question. Yeah. Um, and it, we've worked a lot with so, with plantation wood as well. Um, but you know, just trying to trying to trying to use wood in a in a way that makes the most of it, um, and isn't isn't just um, you know, cutting down or mass producing stuff, uh, you know, to to get. Um, a durable product, but to, to make it, to show the beauty and elevate um, the material as much as possible. Thanks, Bill. Wendell, did you have a comment? Last, Don't forget the mic, Wendell. For the last 10 years or more, we've only used American woods. And mostly what we use is American ash. And the ash borer is devastating the ash trees, but they are still usable for furniture because the ash borer doesn't bore any further than into the candium layer. And so the wood is still usable, so there's a huge amount of ash on the market. There'll be a day when it isn't, but right now, lots of it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. There's another question here. Um, I was thinking about a comment that Wendell made about computers wanting to erase mistakes and that in itself being a mistake. And I was wondering if there were moments, um, for those of you that work with digital technologies, if um, in moments when they're being uncooperative or um, you know they're just not working with you, they're not performing how you want them to, if those moments actually ended up being generative for you or um, helped you see things in a new way or ended up being of benefit to your work. It makes me think of Michael's example of the glitch cabinet this morning, too. Yeah. Um, so productive mistakes, happy accidents? Well, the mistakes I was referring to are in the model stage. I mean, I do not work in the computer. So I draw. And when I have an idea that looks promising, I will make a three-dimensional model in scale. Now, because the model is only like so big, very small imperfection when blown up to full size is somewhat bigger. But I'm the one that made the model, and whatever's in the model, I want to stay. I'm not trying to get rid of any of those things that are there. And I'm referring to those as mistakes. Uh, maybe they should be called something else, but maybe imperfections or just little things that happen. And to me, those, I want to keep those. Can I tell a quick non-furniture story just because we're in Washington and it's a good Washington story? Um, you know the giant Calder, Alexander Calder, that's in the National Gallery Modern Wing? Apparently, that is the only large sculpture that was ever made for Calder, not by his preferred fabricator, because the National Gallery sourced the fabricator. And normally, his fabricators realized that they didn't need to take a calipers and exactly mathematically increase the diameter of each element based on the little wire hand-twisted prototype that Calder made in his studio. But in this case, apparently, the fabricator did just that. And Sandy Rohr, who's the head of the Calder Foundation, described the National Gallery's Calder as a Klaus Oldenburg Alexander Calder. Is, is, is it, giant size exact equivalent to what his little handmade model was. So bear that in mind next time you go see that sculpture. It's a nice little story. Sorry that, sorry for the departure from furniture, but yeah. Could I right. say something? Yeah, please. <laughs> I just saw that piece yesterday, yeah. and I was standing there looking up at it and wondering why the scale was so huge on those arms. Exactly. <laughs> That's the reason, yeah. <laughs> sort of lost in translation. Yeah, Vivian. I think that uh, one of the things that we'll see, and I, I feel like I was... Uh, just talking, talking about this with a, a digital design and fabrication class I'm teaching right now. 
um, is that we'll look back at this time and be able to identify designs by what program they were designed in. Yeah. Um, I think you can kind of already. And th there's a good reason for that. Each of those CAD programs is a different mathematical formula that is, it's expressing. You know, so it has stuff that it likes to do. Um, and I think like any other tool, you have to learn how to trick it into doing what you envision. Mm. Um, I think that's true of, of any tool, mm. um, whether it be a chisel or a welder, you know, whatever. That there's always, in a way, it's like, you know, you can hack anything, as mm. it were, um, to use a newer terminology. But I think that's important as makers to do. You do have to trick the computer and the robot all the time. <laughs> Good thing we're still smarter. Christy. <laughs> Uh, I would say I, I have had happy accidents with machines, um, but not because of their limitations, but because of knowing how the machine works. For instance, um, when laser cutting veneer marquetry, I've noticed that it'll leave a slight bevel on it sometimes if I set the power a little too high or set the focus a little off. So then I can take that and use my advantage and make it into double bevel marquetry, which fits, you know, perfectly and way better than, than regular laser marquetry works. So I think knowing the machines and, and what their limitations are, and like uh, Vivian was saying, knowing what machine designed something from a specific time period, um, that's, I think that's the most frustrating part about using CAD programs is that they have limitations and yes you do have to trick them into doing what you want them to do and a lot of times it's less about knowing the software and more about knowing how to rig a piece of wood on the machine that's not quite right <laughs> and then doing you know partial by hand partial by machine just to play devil's advocate for one second before we leave that topic why is it a bad thing to for the furniture but to betray the program any work any more than it would be a bad thing to for example see a hand chiseled surface because it, couldn't you just interpret that as a kind of truth to the process? Mm -hmm. In other words, maybe it should say Rhino, if that's the program you used. Rhino is a software program, so maybe it should look like it was made in Rhino. It's a kind of weird modernist way of thinking, perhaps, but is that invalid? I, I would say um, it's more honest to say, leave the tool marks in. Mm -hmm. um, like on a CNC piece, it has to make so many paths. And if you give it more paths to do, it'll look more like a hand carved piece or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think it's a little bit dishonest to, I mean, of course, you want to make the piece look good, but I think it's a little bit dishonest to try to pass it off as a handmade piece. In that case. Uh, Bill, you had a comment. Oh, I was just going to uh, sort of follow up with that. In a, it's Maybe it's not a ha sort of like happy surprise, but the, one of the ways we use our CNC router the most is to make the, the jigs for our metalworking. Um, and it allows us to, to make very precise jigs for, for hand done stuff. Um, and it's not something that you see in the final product, but um, it's very much a part of the process that we're able to, to use it. Absolutely. I think people who don't spend time in uh, shops often don't appreciate how much of the work is preparatory rather than what's actually going on on the finished piece of furniture is getting ready to make the thing often. Um, other questions? Yeah, Nora, do you have a question? Thanks. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes about furniture, which Wendell sort of made me think of when he said that he didn't mind that the furniture was not comfortable, was uh, George Nelson's creation of the slat bench. Um, and he talked about the fact that he had created the slat bench for his own use in his office and that it was comfortable for about 30 minutes. And that was it. Because after 30 minutes, if he hadn't seen you yet in his office, he probably didn't want to see you in his office. Um, so I was sort of interested to sort of come back to a little bit about what Michael had talked about this morning and hear what any of you had to say about the social manipulation of furniture, the way that furniture really does um, transform the environment in some ways that are a little bit invisible. So talking a little bit about uh, user's experience and how you are actually actively shaping that and maybe also talking a little bit about your work, which many of you, your work is a status symbol for people, so how it's manipulating different social spheres. Great question. 
Anyone want to take that one off? Wendell? Well, it's odd, but I don't meet very many of the people who buy my furniture, and I don't know where it's going. But an awful lot of it, of it is going into a warehouse, which is, you know, the art collectors have warehouses. They have more, and they just circulate. They'll move things in and out of their house. And very seldom I ever, am I ever in that house and know how they use it or if they use it at all. Which is, I guess, kind of an unfortunate thing, but uh, I've got pieces all over the world, so I'm not about to go visiting. <laughs> I don't know sure that answer the question, but I, I, I don't think I can answer the question. That is absolutely fascinating, though. So the, for you, clearly, the value is in the making of it, the interest in the making of it, and then once it leaves your possession, there's not yeah, much I mean, you can do. I mean, I've got yes. work in Russia and Kuwait, and you know, yeah. places I'm not going. Maybe that. <laughs> Other thoughts about the social impact or utility of furniture, social use of these forms. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's something that we think about all the time when we're designing, but uh, certainly as, um, you know, the the technology we use becomes more apparent and people are, you know, not, not even calling, but just texting each other, even when they're in the same room, you know, you start to think a little bit more about the environments that we create with the furniture that we make and hopefully bringing people together around an object that they want to talk about, that they want to interact with um, as a way to maybe holding on a little bit to, um, you know, some of those social interactions that I don't know, it feels like we're losing um, daily. Yeah. yeah, I think of, um, you know, I think about the social and psychological a lot um, in the kind of forms that I'm putting together and how people interact with them. But I think um, maybe the heart of it is uh, wanting to make something that has an, an extraordinary amount of empathy, um, this empathetic opportunity. And that's, say, one of the reasons I use a lot of compound curves is I want people to be seduced by it, and I want people to run their hands over it. Um, you know, they don't always let you watch them do that, but sometimes you catch them, you know? <laughs> um, but that is the purpose, I mean, and uh, in say, you know, those works that are you know, made to be extraordinary things or luscious things is that sort of biofeedback, the promise and allure of something beautiful and then being able to be a part of it. But it, make, it makes me think of, on the technology, why do we need to trick the machines? I was thinking about that, because I was like, we we're saying we're tricking the machines, but we're not asking why. And I think that, for me, that's one of the reasons why it needs to be tricked. I don't want it to look like a mathematical formula expressed. I want it to be something that we have an empathetic relationship with. And in, in a lot of ways, I think that can be done, and we talk about it a lot in the history of woodworking with the mark of the hand. But I think there can be the mark of the creativity as well. Um, the mark of the, say, if you're making something that's an abstract form, I think e each of us has our own set of predilections, you know, and biases. And with that, we go out into the world and we're attracted to things and we see them. And that really, the way we take that and re-express it through form and materials is what our individual creativity is as designers, as makers. and keeping that is what makes them empathetic to other people. Mm -hmm. Keeping that individuality in the object is what makes people feel like an individual when they encounter it. Huh. That's great. Christy? Um, I would say uh, the folding furniture that I do is a unique social experience. Um, especially since a lot of times they show in galleries and the galleries display them you know, down on the floor, so you don't necessarily realize they fold up and, you know, without seeing a video or something like that. Um, so the people that do buy them, they really, they love the experience of taking them off the wall, sitting in them, putting them back on the wall. Um, and then I also get a lot of people 
you know, on the internet because I have YouTube videos that have gone viral of the folding furniture and everybody will say, oh, I want that so much, how much is it? Well, the problem with having furniture designed for small spaces is that people that want to buy them live in small spaces and can't really afford furniture. And then they ask me, and then they ask me, well, can I buy the design from you and make it myself? <laughs> yeah. So it's an interesting experience with the folding furniture. Well, I don't know if I heard the question 100%, but um, my work kind of compensates. I'm not a public, public speaker, but I have very strong thoughts and ideas. So my work kind of compensates and does the work for me. So if these cabinets are going to people's homes, then they can say, uh, do you know about executive order 906? And they can open up a cabinet and say, well, you know, they're able to tell that story in their own way that, you know, they wouldn't have told otherwise, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for the wildlife project, too. Easier for me to make a thing and then have somebody interpret that object and understand the severity of the problem through looking at that work. Thank you, Wendy. Speaking through other means, really. Yeah. Yes, question over here. For those of you that have a tradition in as making maquettes in your process, how do you feel about collectors who, once they know that you make maquettes, want to buy them, whether they own the original one or not, because they're fascinated with the process. So they think that that, too, the maquette, becomes an object for sale or possible sale. I, um, I get asked to sell maquettes all the time. I do not sell any of them. However, I have had a few of them uh, printed. And um, I've never sold those, but I've given a few of those away as gifts. But I keep all of my originals. Why is that, Wendell? Well, f first of all, they're fragile. And they could so be so easily broken. And I, I, like, I like to have them around. I mean, I enjoy, I mean, it's like I have them on a shelf. Like I like, you know, I think a library is wonderful with all the books on the shelf. Well, to me, it's all these models on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And occasionally I'll pull one out and think, see, I should do something else with that idea. So they're useful to me, the same as I keep all my drawings. <coughs> I very seldom sell the drawing. Larry, is there any use of maquettes in the Sam Maloof shop, or is everything direct into the material at full scale? Uh, back in the early days, Sam made models for uh, uh, quite a while. And later on, um, he would make uh, maquettes when he had to do a presentation for uh, a church committee or something where he was doing chancel furniture for a large yeah. church. Uh, where one person on the committee might be aware of him and who he is, and the rest may not. So he kind of had to present himself to the whole committee. Uh, by and large, though, um, we work direct in the material. Don't spend the time to do that. Um, and then, as you saw in the slide presentation, the last few pieces he made uh, literally were right out of his head yeah. uh, in real time, mm -hmm. adjusting the aesthetic as he went. And drawing on the material yeah, to show yeah. the lines, yeah. And there was a lot of a lot of manipulation of that form until he got it the way he wanted. The really interesting thing about that is when Stan, Sam started that series, um, because I had worked with him when he was in his late 40s, that's when I began working with him. Uh, all of a sudden, I walked into the shop one day and I saw him and Mike working on a piece of cardboard, uh, trying to figure this thing out. And I looked at him, and he had the same intensity that I remembered from him back in the 60s. And it just blew my mind, that just like on point, and 
he had not been feeling well. He was, had some problems with his hips and back. And, and uh, to see that energy surge back right at the end like that was really amazing. Yeah. Uh, but basically, no, we, we just worked direct. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, what Vivian just said about that individuality, that strength of individuality and having that connection. I mean, he's, you know, a paradigmatic example of that, isn't he? Well, there's another thing I wanted to say. A couple of years ago, I was reading Samuel Beckett. So I don't know why I went back and decided to, to re-experience that. And I came across this line out of a bunch of gibberish um, <laughs> that said, uh, <laughs> the role of objects is to restore sil silence. And I immediately thought of Sam. And so we were talking about how um, the objects we make affect and change uh, society, which I, um, I distill down into the individual. Um, after years and years of going to openings and having people come to the shop and touring people on the tours that I give, um, they walk into a room and see a Sam piece and just go into another state. Yeah. And uh, it's transforming. And there's something about his energy in those. And uh, when I talked about perfection, I was talking about uh, a constant visual rhythm where your eye doesn't stop anywhere. It's a total presence. Mm. And I think that's what that's about, that he was able to create a piece that reaches deep into the soul of people. Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, question all the way in the back. Um, you've spoken a lot about the impact of technology on design, on fabrication, um, and uh, you barely touched on the question of uh, the, the impact of technology on moving uh, uh, makers' works into the marketplace to the end user, to the, to the collector, whatever. Uh, and of course, a number of, of traditional makers have been impacted by the loss of uh, long-time galleries closing. Uh, I'm not aware of galleries coming along that are replacing those really substantial uh, galleries. Um, and the question is, how do you see technology, uh, the, the use of internet uh, websites uh, or uh, uh, you know, online galleries uh, affecting what's going on to um, happen in that in that way and do you see uh, the, the role of the traditional gallery uh, continuing uh, growing disappearing uh, how do you see all the dynamics of that obviously it's an important question for makers who are trying to make a living doing what you all are doing okay thank you so a question about uh, the sale of work either online and how to replace the galleries that are closed and no longer with us yeah. A place like uh, First Dibs, uh, I would say a large percent of the work on First Dibs actually is from galleries. Yeah. It should, galleries are using it as another tool. Yeah. But I don't see that galleries are going to be giving up their exhibition space because it's a very, <coughs> I think it's a very small part of their market. And it's very inexpensive, so they do it. But I don't see the galleries being impacted by it. I do know a few dealers in New York who no longer have a physical space and they only do online and art fairs. And it might be that we see that more commonly in the future. Of course, that's New York City where space is at a premium, but Bill. Yeah, um, you know, for the first 10 years that we were uh, doing, making furniture, designing furniture, uh, we, didn't have a, we didn't have a gallery or a showroom space. And we tried, you know, work with some some galleries sometimes, but what we ended up doing uh, last year was to open our own um, showroom gallery space in Tribeca, um, and that allowed us to have full control over the space. We you know, could do whatever we wanted in there and um, show our work. And I think with furniture especially, unlike other products you buy online, um, there is like a lot of people want to, to see it and to in person and to touch it. And I think that that will always, I mean, it'll maybe, shift a little bit, but that'll always be something that, especially with the, the, the higher end fine furniture, um, people want people to wanna, wanna touch it. I, um, I couldn't sell a thing to save my life, and so I rely, I rely on the gallery completely. And I know I have a lot of colleagues who complain about 
how difficult it is to work with galleries and the percentage and whatever. I'm, I'm willing to work with galleries because they're able to do the thing that I can't do very well at all. And so I'm, I'm all for representation by a gallery. Another thing that, that galleries do so much more than the general public would ever know yeah. that they do. I mean, like they protect their artists to an, when one of a, their artist's pieces comes up at auction somewhere, they're going to bid if it isn't going well. They're going to make sure that it sells for a decent price. Yeah. And they, and when you when they have an when you have an exhibition at galleries, that they they really have gone to work hard a month before the exhibit has started, contacting people about it, and perhaps even making sales. Yeah. Uh, and they publish things like catalogs, mm -hmm. and even are involved in helping with publications, full books getting published. I mean, they do a lot. And more commonly today, galleries are also putting up front investment into the fabrication of pieces as well. Yes, they so they're do. actually making the production of the work possible. Yeah, absolutely. Vivian. But not for that many people. Right. Yeah. You know, that's, that's back to, you know, furniture is a very wide, wide field. Um, and there's a lot of different materials. There's a lot of different price points. And I think in general, just because uh, in some ways, you know, this is connected to the Renwick, we're talking about wood and we're talking about studio furniture, um, which isn't really a huge slice of the furniture world. Um, I think there are some generational differences uh, that you would think of people who are kind of coming into the field now are going to have more of the um, one-off design approach yeah. um, to a business model or small production, a lot like what you guys are doing. And in that case, the sort of relationship with the gallery is quite different um, than it is as somebody who makes furniture that's really fine art, you know? Um, that that's a very intimate relationship, whereas when you look in the design field, you often find somebody that has their own showroom, has their own production line, um, works with companies that produce things, and also might do a project with a gallery like one line of things, one design that's that galleries to sell. So there's a, I think there's a huge difference in the approach um, generationally. But I see, I don't, I don't know if you guys agree with that. Or not. Sounds right. <laughs> um, do we have time for one last question? Yes, this will one be the last final question. question. Great. Sam and his plays left a legacy. And the question is, uh, what's your sense of that legacy? And if we wanted to forward it, how would you forward it? Uh, I, I think there are things that came out of what we've been talking about of Ann Sam uh, that are significant. Larry, can you speak to that first? Do you mind? Well, I think one of the most important things about understanding Sam is that his energy and perseverance um, uh, made him an icon in our culture. He literally changed lives uh, through the 60s and 70s. Professional people dropped out of um, really good jobs because they wanted to move to the country and work with their hands. And so he had a major impact on a number of aspects of our culture. Um, at this point in time, the corporation is uh, separate from the foundation um, and it's thriving, taking orders and producing work and carrying Sam's design and his energy forward. But uh, the other aspect of that is the fact that Sam influenced tens of thousands of young people and older people who uh, wanted to do something with their hands. And I think an important part of carrying that legacy forward is to create a situation where um, we can inspire people to become in touch with their own personal creativity. And so I think that's going to be a big aspect in the future of the foundation. Wendell, can I ask you to speak a little bit to this? Because you were, um, of course,
course, intimately familiar with Sam. And in fact, you were included together with Sam in the very first show, I believe, that was held at the Renwick in 1975, Wooden Works. And there were only, I think, four or five of you. And so you know Sam Maloof very well. However, you couldn't be a more different character in so many ways. So how do you look at his... We're direct opposites. Exactly. I, I consider that we were good friends. And I have visited him numerous times over the years, and he's visited me in Rochester. Uh, but you're right, I mean, his approach was uh, so different than mine. I remember one time he, he told me, and he was very proud of this, and obviously it's a thing to be proud of, he had 10 years worth of orders for his rockers, which I'm sure he did, he's probably even more than 10. Yeah. And I thought, if I had 10 years of orders for anything that I was making, I think I would just go jump off a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like an unimprovable ending to our day. But I, I, I do just want to conclude by uh, obviously thanking our uh, hosts, uh, Nora especially, for uh, leading the charge, and Jim and everyone at the Maloof Foundation, Gloria, for... Uh, keeping us in such good order all day and, and preparing the way. And of course, everyone at the Renwick and Sam uh, for hosting us and all of our wonderful panelists and speakers from this morning. And I will just leave you this with this one thought that somewhere out there in the world, could be in America, could be elsewhere, is a kid just like Sam Maloof who will do work that's just as important for just as large a number of people if they have the opportunity to. But we don't know who that kid is but we have to be ready for them when they arrive, ready institutionally, ready ethically, uh, ready economically, because it's one thing to have a one-of-a-kind century-making figure like Sam Maloof, it's another thing to have the whole uh, village, you might say, that, that makes his work possible. So I hope that we can still say that about ourselves in the future. So thank you all very much. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, obviously, that concludes the program for this afternoon, but I'd like, you to, like to invite you to the reception that will be right outside the doors in the lobby here, let you know that the museum will be open till 7 o'clock tonight, so feel free to hang around for a little bit and you know, discuss any larger questions. Thank you for coming. <laughs>